I was 15 years old, living in a medium-sized city in North Florida. About 60,000 people, but some areas were really spread out and rural. Don't think of it like New York City or anything. But more like a lot of houses spread out over a huge area and condensed shopping centers. But I was a bit of a punk that my parents had a hard time controlling at the time. So that meant that I basically snuck out constantly and was always riding my bike around the city all hours of the night with my friends, fighting and constantly causing trouble. For reference, I was probably 5'10 and 150 pounds. My next door neighbors, they were my best friends. Their names were Nick and Tim. Nick was younger than us and about 5'5 five five and 140 pounds. Tim was 5'8 and easily 2'10 though. Nick and Tim were brothers only a year or so apart. On that night, Tim had texted me around 1am asking me to ride bikes with him and his brother to his girlfriend's house so that he could get lucky. I remember being hesitant because of how long the bike ride was. I just looked it up and it was like 10 miles from my house to her street. But Tim, he begged and begged me until I just agreed. Our city had a curfew, meaning that any police in the area that saw you and assumed you were a minor would stop you and possibly issue you a ticket and bring you home. That meant that we had to be careful about being seen by cars going by. Well, the bike ride to her house went by without any issues. We took our time, joked around, smoked a little bit, and we genuinely just enjoyed the ride together. We ran out of what little weed that we had on the way and finally got to his girlfriend's house. After what felt like an hour, Tim snuck around the back to go in and Nick and I just sat on an electrical box and talked. Maybe 30 minutes went by and Tim triumphantly snuck out of the house bragging about his time in there and says that we should head out. Annoyed though at how long it took and nearly sober, we both agreed. The first mile of the ride went by smoothly, but then things just changed. You see, we had just passed a decent sized shopping center, closed, and a church. We rode by it slowly in zero rush. After we passed it, it led to a long stretch of road with woods and canals on each side. It had two lanes on each side, separated by palm trees and landscaping in the middle, sidewalks on both sides, and on the right side another road connects to the parkway. We were riding on the right hand sidewalk, and off in the distance we saw a a very tall older man wearing a yellow raincoat and a large backpack. He was walking back and forth on the sidewalk under a streetlight on the corner of the parkway and the side street. We all went silent as we got closer. I don't think he could have seen or heard us as there were no lights over us and there were sprinklers going off in the median that sort of muffled the noises. But I remember hearing him dragging his feet across the ground and mumbling. He was dragging his feet almost like he was trying to brush away the concrete to find something underneath it or something. The mumbling was incoherent and frantic, and honestly, it made my heart sink and my stomach not up a bit. I couldn't understand anything that he was saying, and the only way to go and get home was to go by him. Nick said, yo, let's cross the street and get onto the other sidewalk. Tim and I agreed. I remember this so distinctly too, because... We crossed the landscape median and a jet of sprinkler water hit me directly in the face and got me into my mouth and my eyes and it smelled like sulfur and tasted horrible. But on the other side, we could hear the mumbling and the scraping of his feet clearer. I could now see more details about him and he was smoking a cigarette and was probably 6'5", had on a huge green backpack, was extremely skinny had long grey hair, was wearing combat boots and blue ripped jeans, and he also had a full white beard. He didn't seem to notice us until we were directly across from him. We all had our eyes locked onto his direction when he suddenly stopped walking, talking and scraping his feet, looked up from the ground, and let out what I can only describe as the most god-awful screech that I had ever heard. It was like he tried to say a hundred words at once. None of us knew what he tried to say, but after the initial scream, I could make out, what the F are you doing? It startled us. I mean, we were now 25 yards away from him when he screams, what are you looking at? I was a foolish teenager. I piped up to saying something smart, and Tim riding next to me grabbed onto me and said, don't say anything. 
so I didn't, and in hindsight, I'm actually really glad that I didn't. He kept screaming in our direction, and we kept riding. The further we rode, the fainter the screaming got, and then it stopped. We crossed the street again to the other side and made it about a mile down the road, all of us on edge now. We glanced over our shoulders constantly to make sure that he wasn't following us. We talked briefly about it, how strange it was, etc., but we were glad that it was over with. Or so we thought at least. Now, Nick and Tim were riding in front of me when I thought that I heard something behind me. I turned around and there he was, maybe only an arm's length away from me, headed directly for me. The yellow raincoat hood was pulled up over his head and buttoned now. This guy was standing up on his mountain bike, pedaling as hard as he could. We locked eyes and he started screaming at us. I mean, absolutely screaming at the top of his lungs. He screamed, not words, not any language, but just a constant scream as loud as he could. I have chills writing about this even now as a 25-year-old grown man with a wife and a kid. If someone ever illustrated that image and I saw it, I probably would have a panic attack to be honest. But I screamed he's right behind us, stood up pedaling as hard as I could, I think we all did, and he was right behind us the whole time, screaming. Every so often too, he was practically on top of us, screaming and trying to knock us off our bikes. I don't know how long we rode with him behind us like that, but it felt like forever. I think age played a factor though, because he must have got tired and let us get ahead a bit. Exhausted, we pulled into a neighborhood and started cutting through yards trying to lose him. We jumped off our bikes and all just decided that if he's still chasing us, we're going to make our stand together and fight. It was honestly like a hive mind decision too. All too tired to keep running, it was just our only option really. So we stood there and we waited for him, but he just never came. I don't even remember hearing him. I still can't recall when we actually lost him too. In any case, I called my house phone, waking both my parents up in the process, and told my dad about the situation. He told me to get home, and then they'd figure it out. I asked to talk to my mom, and she yelled at me on the phone and refused to come and pick us up as I stood in the middle of the street, hoping that this crackhead didn't come and kill us all. I get home eventually with Nick and Tim in tow, and they asked if they could crash in my room. Of course, I said yes. I wasn't about to send them back out there. We all still had some really weird feelings about that night, and I guess we just never really spoke about it again after that. I don't know why that was, but I also don't know what he wanted. He was most probably on drugs or something, but it makes me wonder if he would have robbed us or perhaps something worse if he had actually kicked us off our bikes. I'll preface this story by saying that I work graveyard shift at a hospital laboratory, so I'm no stranger to weird, unexplained things happening. However, this experience, well, it happened in my own bedroom a few nights ago. So, generally sticking to my same night shift schedule, I typically find myself going to bed rather late, even on my days off. Monday night, I went to bed at around 3-ish, my girlfriend and cat had already been sleeping in bed. Sometime after I had fallen asleep, I remember my cat jumping up very fast like he had been startled. He did this one or two times and I just rolled over and went back to sleep because cats are weird, right? Well, after he had done it a third time, I sat up in bed myself half asleep to check on him and comfort him and he just wouldn't come to me, which was odd for him. I can remember seeing his distinct shadow on the edge of the bed looking at me, but I had to reach to pet him and he wouldn't move. After this, I laid back down on my side, facing away from the corner of the bed that he was sitting on, and I started to go back to sleep, when I heard the deepest guttural mumbling or growling is the best way that I can explain it, that I had ever heard. I can't remember if it was words or maybe just mumbling, but... It sounded like those voice changes that people use on documentaries when they're interviewing anonymous people and it was super deep. Now, I am not easily freaked out over paranormal stuff. In fact, I kind of enjoy it. But this, 
this for something else and it sent the most insane chills down my spine that I essentially just laid there frozen. I didn't even turn around to look, I just went to bed and acted like I didn't hear it. Now, I don't know if this was some auditory hallucination since I was sort of half asleep or what, but it was a, an interesting experience to say the least. My girlfriend doesn't remember anything from that night, she slept through it all, but it was so clear sounding and very forward sounding like it was coming right from the opposite corner of the bed over my shoulder, like if I had looked someone would have been standing at the edge of the bed. Also, the fact that my cat reacted the way that he did, I don't know, I don't think it was in my head, I think that there was something in my room. So in case anyone has heard or experienced something similar to this, this happened around 2005 to 2009 in San Diego, California. I don't quite remember exact age at the time, but it happened when I was probably like 9 to 12 years old. So, it was a boring night, so my mom, little sister and I decided to go to Walmart just to get out of the house. This particular Walmart shares the same parking lot as a Coles or Target, and as we are walking around in our PJs in the store, a lady approached us and complimented my sister and I for being so cute and pretty. She proceeded to say that she works for a TV network, and her job is to scout or cast families for their reality show. She asked if our dad was in the store with us, and even though we didn't have a dad, I lied and said that he's at home for my mum who doesn't speak English. I didn't want to say that he was in the store in case she would ask to speak to him or whatever, but the lady, who looked quite normal, friendly, and kind of bubbly, continued to compliment my family for being beautiful. As she was talking, I translated it, and we all felt flattered but skeptical by her compliments. Then she said that she would love to cast us if we would follow her to her house so that she could probably film everything to submit to the company. This was the moment that I started averting my eyes to check the shelves for hidden cameras. During this time, family reality and prank shows were pretty popular, so it made the whole situation feel a bit more plausible that we were either really being scouted or this was a hidden camera prank. I was leaning towards it being a prank because we were, one, boring people, and two, weren't particularly so pretty and beautiful as she claimed. Even though I was young and so didn't feel an immediate danger talking to her in the middle of Walmart, with my mum present, mind you, I knew that it was ridiculous to follow a stranger to their house, especially at night. I then politely declined her offer, which she asked a few more times before telling us that if we changed our mind, we can find her in the store. When she left, we checked up and down the aisles for camera crews or hidden cameras because her whole reality show pitch to a first-gen Asian immigrant family just really seemed unbelievable, and we honestly thought that it could only be a prank. I also noted to my mum how it was odd that we didn't even notice her following us earlier when we walked every aisle, and she just came out of nowhere, it seemed. As a kid who watched a lot of true crime and forensic shows, Forensic Files and CSI, I told my mum, what if she was trying to lure us into a trap or something? Like, when we follow her home, there could be more men there, and what if they kill or traffic us or something? I mean, we were probably easy targets since we were only three women, two being kids and immigrants. My mum also thought that it was weird, but instead of going straight to our car, we waited for some time to pass in case the lady or her people would follow us to our car and our home. To this day, sometimes this encounter would creep its way out of my memory bank and it always makes me wonder, what if we did follow her? What if we actually went with her that day? What did she actually have planned for us? Was she one of those bad women that you hear about working with others in order to lure other women and children away? Has she done this before and was she successful with other people? Or was it just honestly a complete innocent invitation? I really do hope that nobody was harmed from her scheme, but something tells me that she was up to no good. Uh, 
I was nine years old when this happened. My sister, my dad, my stepmom and I were at a place called Palmetto Island. It was a camping resort where you just pull up with a tent or a camper and just stay there for a weekend or so. We were in a camper and before I get into the actual story I should probably set the scene. So Palmetto Island wasn't really an island in the traditional sense. It was completely surrounded by palm trees and vegetation except for the road in and out. There were roads in the resort but they were only for golf carts and other smaller vehicles. The whole place was also dense with palm trees and vegetation. If you weren't on the road or in a campsite or at one of the recreational areas, you would be in the forest. So, we, my family and I, were all hanging out at one of the playgrounds there. I had made a new friend I was playing with and at some point, the rest of my family had left me to play with my new friend until eventually he left too. I was there alone and the sun was beginning to set. This wasn't the first time that we'd been to Palmetto Island and I had, at the time, known the place pretty well. I had assumed that the walk back to our campground would be short. However, at some point I had gotten turned around and ended up at an area where you would launch boats into the water to go fishing. There were a group of people there and I asked them for directions. Now, I wasn't completely brain dead, so I lied and said the number of our campsite was about 10 sites down from our actual campsite. They pointed me in the right direction and I started walking. I hadn't known this at the time, but my family had realized that I was no longer at the playground and started driving around in our golf cart and another one that they had rented. And if they hadn't, I probably wouldn't be telling this story right now. You see... As I'm walking toward our campsite, a car pulls up beside me and one of the people that I'd asked for directions rolls down the window. Keep in mind, I'd been walking for about an hour or two in total. He offers me a ride and tells me to ride in the front seat. Me, tired and weary from walking, accepts and gets in the car. I know, I know, this is something that you should never do, but I didn't realize at the time. But we're driving in the right direction until he passes up the entrance to the campsites at which point, I know that something is wrong. I tell him that he passed it up and he doesn't respond. By some stroke of divine luck, I see my dad in a golf cart driving the opposite direction as us and I start yelling and waving at him. He pulls up in front of the car and stops and so does the guy driving. I use the manual unlock in the car door and run to my dad, who has his concealed carry drawn on the guy as soon as I'm out of the way. He calls the police and holds the guy at gunpoint until they get there and they arrest him. I'm only now sharing this story because I found out last week that that guy and his whole family apparently had done this before and they had gotten away with it. I try not to think about what would have happened to me had my dad not showed up when he did like that. But man, that, that was a close call. I've decided to share my story in the hopes that there might be people here with more knowledge or experience on this topic that could help me make sense of what happened to me. I've shared my story with friends and family, but people never really have much to add. Just something along the lines of, wow, that's crazy. Anyway, when I was 19, my uncle asked me to stay with him for the summer. He had just bought a home in rural Pennsylvania, farmland out in Amish country. The home and the property were pretty run down, so he was paying me to stay with him for the summer and work on fixing things up. It was a large old home and had two staircases, one small one in the back part of the house that led directly to his bedroom, and then the main staircase by the front door that led to the other bedrooms. Being a teenager, I used to stay up downstairs watching TV after he had gone to bed. After a few weeks though, I started getting a weird feeling being alone at night there. It's hard to describe, but I would just sort of start to feel like there was somebody else downstairs. Sometimes I would think that I heard someone whispering. I would get slightly paranoid and find myself glancing in the direction of the adjacent sitting room that had nothing but a couple of chairs in it. I chalked it up to the fact that it was just an unfamiliar house and that it gets incredibly dark out there in the middle of nowhere. 
As time went by though, my uncomfortable or scared feeling started escalating. It's hard to explain, but I had that uncanny feeling of being watched when I was alone at night. There were times when I would get up and go into the other rooms downstairs and turn on the lights just to look and make myself feel better. I eventually just stopped staying up downstairs and I would just go to my room and read instead. But then, not long after, the sense of someone else being present began following me into my room, which hadn't been the case before. It was like one moment everything was normal and I was happily reading or lying in bed, and then I would get this weighty feeling of something entering the room and watching me. I just tried to ignore it and I would eventually fall asleep. Things continued to escalate though. The presence started following me into my room virtually every night. I would immediately notice because there would be that weighty change in the feeling of the room and the temperature also seemed to get a lot colder all of a sudden. I would lie in bed at night and hear whispering or breathing in the room. I started sleeping with the lights on at this point. And now, this next part is the point of the story that this is all about. So one night, I was lying on my bed with the lights on reading. I was pretty tired from the work that we had that day and was falling asleep earlier than usual. Everything was normal in the room at this point and I felt relieved because I just wanted to get a good night's sleep anyway. I set my book down and I drifted off. Sometime later though, I was awakened by a strange sound. Lying there with my eyes closed, I could hear something that sounded like rubbing. It wasn't loud, but it was this sort of constant faint rubbing sound coming from nearby. I regained consciousness enough to think, what is that? And I opened my eyes. I looked down towards my chest, uh, I'd been sleeping on my back, and found my left arm extended straight up into the air, reaching towards the ceiling. The rubbing sound was my own fingers, because they were being played with. My fingers were bent and manipulated and the sound was the skin of my fingers rubbing against each other and directly above my head was what I can only describe as a, a black mist or a fog maybe two and a half to three feet wide. Having just woken up what was happening did not immediately register to me. I laid there staring at my hand in the mist for a few seconds sort of confused I think this was compounded by the fact that I couldn't feel my hand at this point, so it almost seemed like it wasn't happening to me. Then, like a bolt of lightning, a jolt of pure terror shot through my entire body. I had never felt terror like this before, and I had been afraid in my life, but I didn't know what terror was until this very moment. I think horror movies actually do a pretty good job of recreating how it feels, with the disorienting camera angles and the music like that, like the famous score from Psycho. In any case, I yanked my arm back and sprang back like a cornered animal, sitting up at the head of the bed, my back and arms pinned against the wall as I stared at this mist. I watched, though, as it just slowly faded away and then it was just gone. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night, replaying it over and over in my head. Like, did that actually happen? Was I dreaming? I must have been dreaming. But I'm sitting here awake. The sheets are kicked off my bed and I sprang up and everything's changed. It happened so clearly. No, it was real. This really happened. But it couldn't have. I decided to tell my uncle the next day. I had mentioned previously that I got creeped out hanging out downstairs alone, but that was the extent that he knew up to this point. To my surprise too, he actually believed me, or maybe pretended to I guess, and said that he got weird feelings in the house at times as well. He also told me that the previous owner had been an elderly man that passed away apparently. At this point, I only had a couple more weeks left at this place before I needed to head home to get ready for my next year at college anyway. I tried to stick it out, but after two entirely sleepless nights, I told him that I was heading home early and I just left. 
He ended up moving for work for reasons uh, a couple of years later, and I did visit him once at that house for a family Thanksgiving, but there's no way that I was sleeping there. Now, I know that this is a bit of a long story, and if you've made it this far, then thank you. But for people who have had experiences or have knowledge on this topic, do you have any thoughts? I'd never had any paranormal experiences before this, didn't even believe in the stuff. I didn't really think about ghosts or whether they were real or not, to be honest. I certainly never thought that they would be able to physically interact with me. And as you can probably guess, I am a firm believer now, but have not had any other experiences and I really hope not to. But if you have any knowledge on this topic or would like to share some thoughts, then I would really appreciate that. About 30 years ago, my wife and I saved up enough money to put down the minimum on our first house. It was an okay house, but not a great neighborhood, and it was built in 1910. Since we didn't have enough money or stuff to warrant a legit moving company, I gathered several friends to help us move. As we were hauling stuff into the house, my next door neighbor came over and introduced himself to me. His name was Jack. But Jack was really friendly and even brought over a plate of cookies to welcome us to the neighborhood. After several minutes of chatting, Jack said something that made me question if I heard him right. Yeah, me and the other neighbors, we were really surprised the house sold actually, well, given the incident. I first clarified with him that I heard him correctly, and I did. After an awkward silence, I asked him, what incident? He was at first surprised at my lack of knowledge, and then apologetic for bringing it up, but I said, please, what incident? He went on to tell me that the former owner was an old woman who was bound and gagged, and then her whole house was robbed. Since we bought it from her kids, we had no idea that this had happened. We knew that the neighborhood wasn't wonderful, but that, that seemed extreme. Anyway... On our first night there, a really strange thing happened. Just after 10pm, the phone rang, but when I answered, nobody was on the other end. On the second night, at about the same time, it rang again, and again nobody was there. And the third night, and the fourth night, I then called the operator, this was when landlines and operators were a thing, and asked her to see who was calling me just after 10 every night. And she said that nobody was. That was definitely weird. The next day, I found my next-door neighbor working in his garden, and I asked him to explain in detail the break-in. When he got to the part about it happening while his neighbor was watching the evening news just after 10 p.m., I couldn't help but shudder. I told my wife, and being the more level-headed one, she thought that it was just a weird coincidence. Anyway, the call came every night that we lived there, and it actually became a bit of a joke for the two of us. We can't go to sleep yet, the phone's about to ring. And sure enough, like clockwork, it did every night. Four years later though, our little boy had just turned three. One day, my wife had asked him to go play in the basement while she cooked dinner. He told her that that lady doesn't want me down there. He was happy and matter of fact when he said it, but... My wife and I both looked at each other in horror. He was sometimes hard to understand, so we asked him to repeat what he had just said, trying our best not to show any emotion. And he said exactly the same thing. That lady doesn't want me down there. He never again went down in the basement, and we never asked him to either. Furthermore, we put the house on the market the very next month. Now, I don't believe in the paranormal, and I still don't, but I thought that you guys might find this interesting. So, I go to bed during the night, like most people. Everybody else has already gone to bed, and as I lay in my bed, I begin to hear breathing sounds. Heavy, very human-sounding breathing sounds. They're coming from right outside of my window, and after a bit, I get up and look out my window, opening it now the breathing sound is coming from much further away 
from my neighbor's house, like 15 to 10 meters away. It's the same human sounding heavy breathing, but now it has completely moved away from me. I can still hear it very clearly, but I close the window and I get back into bed. But then all of a sudden, the breathing has zipped right back. It's right outside of my window again. In fact, it seems to be right outside the glass. There's no mistaking it too. I did this again one or two times, opening the window with the same result. Then window closed as I go into my bed once again. I hear the heavy breathing, but now it's coming from right in my air vent. The air vent is situated on the floor, just before my bed, slightly to the right. And it honestly sounds as if there's an invisible face just behind the air vent screen. This isn't air pumped from the vent, mind you. It's the exact same human-like heavy breathing from before. This goes on for some time too, but later it switches to coming from my doorway. My door is open, by the way, leading back to the corridor. It's dark out there, so I can't really see, but it does seem as if someone is standing right in the doorway, even though I can see that there's nobody there. Not being able to do anything, eventually I just tell myself to go to sleep, and I do. I know that that's an anticlimactic ending, but what else am I supposed to do, honestly? Ever since then, it has never happened again, except that one night. I have no idea what caused it, what it was, and it wasn't like I was sleep deprived or anything. I don't take anything, I haven't done any drugs in my life, I don't have any mental health issues or anything, so I was perfectly awake and fine and everything, not tired at all, and... It's just the weirdest thing that has ever happened to me. For a bit of background, this was one of my first significant one-on-one -on -one run ins with the unknown. I had just gotten out of the army and was living in a small Pennsylvania town with my ex-wife that was primarily built around the steel industry. However, once the company went out of business, it took the town with it. Unemployment and general lawlessness was the order of the day. Drive-by shootings, gruesome drug-related murders, kidnappings, and also rampant drug use. That is to say that the whole town had a, a sort of heaviness to it. Hey, but at least the rent was cheap, right? As I mentioned earlier, I had just finished my contract with the army after having been deployed to Afghanistan during route clearance missions just a year prior. I guess, as is expected, I was having a heck of a time trying to readjust back to civilian life. And as a result, my ex and I spent most of our time getting into vicious verbal arguments and occasional physical fights. Taking long walks at all hours of the day or night was my preferred method of avoiding either of these confrontations. It usually involved me walking around town during the day or around our large block during the evenings or early mornings. This particular night was no different. I made my escape and headed out into the poorly lit streets for at least three hours. After completing my sixth circuit, I decided that things had probably calmed down enough for me to try and get some sleep as by this point it was already four in the morning and I was extremely tired and also a bit sore now. As I turned the corner that led back to my block stretch of a sidewalk, I suddenly saw a, a dark figure appear right outside the chain link fence that surrounded my small front yard. But my first thought was that it was a burglar. After all, that sort of extracurricular activity wasn't all that uncommon in this town. Heck, most took place during the day even. Either way, I was upset that he'd potentially gotten the drop on me like that considering that my hypervigilance was partly what kept me alive overseas. About 15 seconds of us stumbling across each other, I was suddenly hit with a wave of what I can only describe as utter terror, dread, and despair that gives me chills just thinking about it nearly 10 years later. To make matters worse, my foe began walking in a way that I couldn't tell whether he was walking towards or away from me. But perhaps the best way to describe it was that he was walking in pace, appearing as though he was getting closer before switching to getting further. Time slowed down, but my heart sped up, and then I began to walk. I couldn't help it. My brain was screaming at my legs to stop, but 
They kept going as though they were being pulled by an unseen force. It was at this point that I got a semi-better look at this individual, though all I could really make out was a dark outline despite him standing almost directly under a street lamp. Of course, this just ramped up my anxiety to a hundred. It was also when the nausea and the lightheadedness set in. At some point, I was able to regain some control over my legs, forcing them to take small baby steps instead of the large strides that whatever this thing was had made me do. However, I was still getting closer and closer to them and them to me. By this point, there were only three houses between us when I was able to make out that he was wearing not only a hood, but what looked to be a cape as well. The dread that I was feeling went into max overdrive when it hit me that I didn't think that I was dealing with a human. There were only two houses in between now, and I began to pray that God would step in and save me from whatever this was. After what felt like way too long, I could finally see that they were actually beginning to walk away from me and towards the opposite end of the block. Clearly, it wasn't too happy as it began flapping its cape angrily, it seemed. Almost like a, a cat flicking its tail when it's sort of ticked off. But within seconds, it was completely gone from my line of sight, disappearing as quickly as it had come. I was immediately able to regain full control over my legs and overcame the nausea long enough to run up to my front door and pound on it until my ex let me in. She wasn't overly happy, but... I could have cared less by that point. To this day, I fully believe that what I encountered was probably a demon that was either drawn to our home because of the constant turmoil, or the cause of it. Either way, it still sends shivers up my spine whenever I tell this story, and honestly, I really hope that I never, ever run into anything like this ever again. I was driving home from my house sitting in another city. It usually takes me about six hours to do this on my motorcycle because I have to pull over regularly to massage feeling back into my butt and stretch my legs. But I left at around 11.30 a.m. and missed a weather alert with a thunderstorm warning along my route. This road takes me through the mountain passes with lots of hairpin turns. Normal speed is about 80 kilometers an hour, and a couple of these turns have posted speeds going as low as 30 kilometers an hour. So, it is hailing and pouring rain, full on thunderstorm weather. I'm doing my best to keep to the speed limit while also being safe, and there is nowhere to pull over and wait it out, and not that many passing lanes either. On the last hairpin turn, I slow down to take it at the posted speed, and this huge truck, who's been behind me for about 15 minutes, pulls into the oncoming lane, illegally mind you, and speeds up next to me, laying on the horn. It's a blind corner, but he sees oncoming traffic coming at him, and instead of doing the smart thing and slowing down to get back behind me, he decides to gun it. Now, if I hadn't have downshifted when I realized what he was going to do, he absolutely would have nailed me, with a 30-inch trailer that he was dragging behind him, sending me flying off the cliff next to us. And to be honest, it's hard not to believe that that may have been his purpose. I mean, the way that he came over like that, so aggressively, I think that he may have been trying to kill me. The next town is about a 20-minute drive away, and I pull into a gas station to dry out a little and calm down after what had just happened. And I just watch him just drive away. About two hours later, I pull into a fruit stand to grab a snack and take a break. This is now three towns further down the highway. And lo and behold, he sees my motorcycle and pulls in to have a go at me. He yells at me that he had to teach me a lesson for slowing down on the highway. To the posted speed limits for safe turns, of course. And when I asked him what he would have done if he'd killed me... He told me that apparently it would have been my own fault and he would have laughed as I went over the cliff. So yeah, he confirmed to me that he had actually tried to kill me. A 
A few years ago, I worked in a busy but dangerous area of Rio de Janeiro. There are just too many streets where local criminals can ambush pedestrians, mug them, and effectively run into hiding. But one day, I worked until 7pm and my fiancé picked me up. The streets were already deserted, so we decided to find a safe spot and call an Uber. We quickly found two men watching the entrance of a store. One of them was a doorman in uniform, while the other one was wearing regular clothes and speaking into a walkie-talkie. Which means that, so far, it's just regular Rio stuff. The second guy and I had some small talk about how dangerous the area was, though. After which, we all went silent. The Uber was taking some time, so he eventually asked if I was sure that it was coming. I checked and confirmed. He decided to explain his curiosity. Well, you know, today will be a specially dangerous day. We want to do something about these low lives. As a cop, I find it distasteful. I immediately hid the shiver that came down my spine. Vigilante death squads are a big deal in Brazil, and a word to the wise is enough. I took a deep breath and played dumb to be sure. Are you a civilian or a military cop? He smirked and answered. Today, I'm neither. And, more or less, after a long minute, the driver arrived and we said goodbye and left. On the following day, I saw almost no homeless people in the area. I knew why they didn't want to be seen there because nothing ever appeared on the news, but I knew that all those homeless people... They had been massacred. So, about two weeks ago, I started getting what I can only describe as stuck in my dreams. What I mean is that, no matter how hard I tried to wake up, it was nearly impossible. And when I do wake up, I feel drained or... Like I'm waking up from anesthesia after maybe 10 to 13 hours of sleep. Normally, I would only sleep like 6 to 8 hours. My dreams, they tend to take place from when I was younger, but in an eerie and sort of unsettling way. Anyway, that's what my dreams have been like, no matter at night or during a nap. And my older sister said last week that she was walking down the hall past my room. My door was open and normally my door naturally shuts almost closed. And she noticed out of her peripheral something was walking into my room at the same pace as she was. And she originally thought that it was me but she noticed that it was looking at her as if it was trying to figure out how to walk properly. And she also noticed that it looked like me but when I had long hair, my hair hasn't been long since like 2019... She saw it twice in one day and she says that it seemed to be trying to mock how she was walking but she ignored it and saw me in the kitchen where she told me that she just saw this figure in my room that she obviously thought was me at first. But last night I stayed at my boyfriend's house and but last night I stayed at my boyfriend's house and I texted my younger sister whose room is across from mine to make sure my bedroom door was closed shut for me but her phone was on D&D. She got home though and started walking down the hall to get to her room. She said that she was being kind of loud with her keys banging against her hydro flask which normally would irritate me if I'm trying to sleep and she said that she heard my door open and as she was walking near her bedroom door that is she heard a, a whisper say what are you doing? Obviously, she assumed that it was me being irritated that she was being loud and so she looked up, moving her hair out of her face that prevented her from seeing my bedroom door in the first place. And that's when she realized that my door was open but nobody was there. She hurried to her bathroom and opened her text and that's when she saw 20 minutes prior I had just asked her to close my door because I wasn't home. She was super freaked out by this and... We began FaceTiming. My boyfriend was making jokes about it and I told him to stop because I didn't want him to mock whatever it was. And soon after that FaceTime call ended, I told my boyfriend that her phone probably died but right after she texted me saying that, did your phone die? And I told her no, I thought yours did. There wasn't a call failed or anything, just 
A pop-up screen just both ends beeped as if the other hung up. The energy in my room has been unsettling, like something is watching me as well. My sleep has been really abnormal, more than usual, and when I do wake up, something always pulls me back to a deep sleep. And I guess my question to you is, what is all of this about? I really can't find anything online about this, and this is honestly my last attempt to try and get some answers. So if you know anything about this, then please do let me know, because I really need some help. So this happened a few months ago. My boyfriend went on a short trip with his friends. The original plan was for them to go on this poker cruise, but this got cancelled because the boat didn't have a place to harbour or something like that. The boat would have gone to Norway, apparently, so my boyfriend and his friends, four other friends, decided to drive to the Czech Republic instead. <laughs> Who knows why, but I only found out about this when they were already on their way. All they did was play poker in different places, one of them being King's Casino. He loved that place, by the way, and it really did look beautiful from the photos. Anyway, their way back is actually when something terrifying happened. It happened on the drive back when they were on the highway in Germany. In the car was my boyfriend and two of his friends. The others were in different cars and left earlier, apparently. After quite the drive, they needed to take a pee, and so they decided to stop at this abandoned-looking place where a lot of truck drivers stopped. It did give them a bit of a creepy vibe, but they really needed to go, so they still decided to stop there quickly, something that they regretted very much. So, picture this. An abandoned-looking place with a lot of trucks, presumably with the truck drivers in there asleep, with a dark forest stretching beyond view in the middle of the night. Quite creepy, right? My boyfriend and his friends arrived there, and they got out to do their business. While walking, one of his friends made a joke about how it's such a typical place for a murder to happen. It did make him feel a bit uneasy, but they still laughed it off. At some point, they found a good place to take a pee, and it wasn't far from their car, but after a minute or so, one of them suddenly says, Somebody's coming. And my boyfriend and the other friend obviously freaked out a bit, but thought that it was a joke until they heard footsteps running towards them. It was approaching fast as well, and someone was full-on sprinting towards them. Once they heard that, they all started running for their lives towards the car and frantically got in. They sped out of there as fast as possible, but my boyfriend and friend, who wasn't driving, were trying to see if they could see who it was. It was too dark to see anything, so they never knew who charged at them that night. This really freaked my boyfriend out though because he couldn't sleep when they got to my place. Along the way, he dropped off his friends. And when he told me the story, it really creeped me out too. I mean, why would someone charge at you like that in the night if they didn't have really malicious intent? All I could think about was the horrible things that could have happened to him if they didn't get out of there safely like they did. I also got kind of mad at him and went off at him about wanting to become an unsolved mystery or something and I was just really terrified for him I guess. We can laugh about it now but when it happened it freaked us both out a lot and quite honestly I do think that all of those guys are probably pretty lucky to be alive. So I've lived in my house for seven years, and my whole childhood, I felt like something was watching me. I often told my mother that I thought that our house was haunted. I've experienced minor things the entirety of living here, like my backpack falling off of my armchair, my hair being touched or moved while I'm alone, seeing shadows and also sleep paralysis, but nothing too major I guess. My mum recently made the decision to sell the house though and that's when things started happening. You see, a few days ago, one of my sisters mentioned that she was home alone yet heard someone walking around opening and closing doors. Both of my sisters have said that they were home alone and heard a, a woman scream from the back of the house. And last night, I experienced quite a lot. 
The night started off as normal until I went into my sister's room to show her something. I saw a, a tall, shadowy figure right next to her bed where she was laying, and I ask her if she sees it too. She tells me that I'm not funny and to stop messing with her, so I leave. Later into the night, I feel incredibly uneasy though, like something is watching me and is out to get me or my daughter. I constantly look back at my baby to make sure that she's okay because I just have this crippling feeling of fear. I think that she's in danger or something like that. It was so bad that I hardly slept all night. I tossed and turned because I just felt this constant presence of danger in the room. I wake up in the morning and I left the room to make some coffee and I'm overcome with that strong sense of fear that my daughter's in danger alone in the room. So I run in and I grab her and I instantly go into the living room. Every time that I've looked down the hall too, I, I see a, a shadow peeking around the corner and then go back instantaneously. I try to brush it off and later put the baby down for a nap. One of my sisters comes into my room and she says that she's going to the pool. I say bye and she leaves. Later, I'm on my computer, which is across from my bed, and I get up to get some water at some point. I look down the hall and the bathroom light's on and the doors are closed. I think to myself, okay, so my other sister is still here, and go back to my room. I go to refill my water and the doors are open and the lights are off. I knock on my sister's room and open it and she's not there. I call her and say, hey, did you leave with the other sister when she went to the pool? She says yes and with that, my heart sank. I tell them what happened and they say check the house and the attic. I don't want to do it myself so I call my aunt and she sends my uncle and cousins over. My uncle checks the house with a gun and he finds nobody and my mind instantly goes to the experiences that I've been having. They calm me down eventually and then they go back home. I lock all the doors and lock myself in the room. My dogs are barking like crazy now and I really don't know if it's paranormal or if somebody might actually be in the house but I keep turning back with the feeling that something is trying to get me and I just cannot shake it. What should I do? This event happened in the middle of the last half of last year, 2022, and the middle of the first half of this year, 2023. So I'm a student in the Polytechnic of Port Dixon, Malaysia. I was living in a house with six of my classmates in a nearby, somewhat remote small town in the same district. We're used to commuting to our college using several roads with a stretch of about maybe 10 kilometers, which runs in the middle of the forest oil palm plantation. The road had no road lights. We depend on our high beams when using the road at night because we literally cannot see anything beyond 20 meters at night. I have a bike though which I used to commute from place to place just like the other five of my classmates. And one guy had a car which we would often go carpooling in. Now back in 2022 me and five of my mates went out to eat at night after a hiking trip to the nearby hiking spot on the weekend, leaving one guy, Chad, at home because he was sleeping. While we were returning home from eating outside, we received a text in the group chat that we'd made for us. It was my friend back home saying something like, What time will you guys come home? It felt lonely in the house because Mike is still sleeping in his room, which was obviously weird because... I mean, I was in the car with the rest of the housemates, so I replied, I'm not in the house, bro. I went with them. He didn't respond after that, until we reached home. After reaching home, we opened the door and saw him crouching in a fetal position by the staircase in the living room with a scared expression on his face. We all were about to ask him what's wrong, but he instantly told us what happened. Apparently, he said that he saw me sleeping on the floor in my room, feet facing the door with the lights and the fan off. He didn't think about anything at first until he got my message in the group chat and he realized that it wasn't me that he saw and his stomach dropped upon reading my message. So he went back to check my room again to make sure that somebody was actually there, but when he did, 
nobody was. We joked around a bit about that with him and I even knocked on my friend's door to let myself know that I'm going in. We didn't take him too seriously is what I'm getting at. Just to try and calm his nerves down I guess. We also don't really have trouble sleeping that night but I'm sure that he didn't get much sleep. Anyway, um, a few weeks ago and one day when I'm downstairs with one of my housemates doing assignments while waiting for my other housemates to arrive from eating outside, I noticed somebody walking barefoot outside the gate. The gate was open so I had to look and analyze the person walking. Whoever they were, they made footstep sounds but I don't know, something just felt off about it. So I went over to take a look. I opened my door and walked to the gate to see that... Whoever was there is now gone. I was curious though, so I walked the same direction as I saw whoever they were walking and looked along each road at the four-way intersection on our neighborhood. The person though was just gone. It was really quick though, judging from the time that it took for me to reach outside the gate, maybe 10 seconds. I went back inside to tell my housemate who was doing assessments about what had just happened. Fast forward a few weeks, I was riding my motorcycle alone through the dark road after eating outside with my mates again. At this time, I'm the only one not in the car with them. And midway, there was an intersection which was the only lit up part of the road. I was going to switch lanes, so I looked at my side mirror to make sure that there were no cars behind me so that I could safely merge. But I noticed a reflection of a person in white cloth on my back seat, waving in the wind. I was wearing all black at that time. I didn't think too much of it because I'm more concerned about my safety in the dark road. But as I went deeper into the road, the reflection became darker and darker due to the absence of light in the area. So I kept on riding home without much thought put into it. But as I'm arriving home, I park my bike outside the gate and look at my bike from afar. I didn't want to open the gate because I didn't want anything that followed me to come home inside with me. So I waited for my friends to arrive before making a decision. I told it, whatever it was, to go away and don't follow me. But I don't know if it worked or not. I had cold sweats and chills at that time though because honestly it was pretty terrifying. As my friends arrived though, Chad asked me what was wrong. I told him everything that happened and he told me to calm down and advised me to tell it to go away and don't bother us. I did just that and went inside like normal. No nightmares nor disturbances that night so I believed at the time that everything was fine. But ever since that day I, I've just been getting more and more paranoid when riding my bike at night. I noticed this particular smell when riding too. It smells sort of like flowers but it was unpleasantly fragrant. It sort of seems like you're smelling someone with perfume up close but... It's way too strong. The smell doesn't arrive every time though and I went through that road multiple times. It's just weird. Another day though, I went through another road that led to our home. It's been a couple of weeks since I last smelt the fragrance smell. Until that moment. Because I felt like something was wrong and I said out loud, do not follow me. However, at that moment... I didn't see anything behind me in my side mirror. It was getting annoying at that point though and I think I was just frustrated. I don't even feel scared or threatened by it anymore. It just feels like you're being played with almost. Anyway, we then went on our semester break which I attended a camp for the month and returned back to the same house for the next semester. We didn't have any encounters for a good couple of months from the beginning of the semester too. Until one day, I was sleeping downstairs in the living room and was woken up by a voice that seemed to mimic the voice of Chad. Wake up, Mike, is what they said. I thought something bad had happened, so I opened my eyes, but in my vision, the whole living room was dark with the exception of our porch light shining through. But when my eyes adjusted, I definitely saw someone tall standing over me, but... At the time, I thought it was just Chad who woke me up. So I asked him what was wrong, but I didn't get a reply. I then looked at the thing standing over me to see if it was really him. Whoever it was, though, they were really tall. 
dark, but I couldn't see a face since it was so dark and I just woke up from my sleep so my eyes were adjusting still. But I then realized that something is off by the unusual length of the delay in getting a response, so I told it, don't bother me, I'm sleeping. Then I rolled to my right and closed my eyes. I heard footsteps at the staircase, and it was not like someone going back up to their room, but instead the footsteps sounded like it was going up and down the stairs multiple times. I got annoyed by this and looked at the staircase with the intention to yell at whoever was playing at the staircase, but when I did, there was nobody there. But the strangest thing was that the sound of the footsteps was still there and they continued for about another five minutes. Then my friend's watch alarm sounded, which then I knew what time it was. The watch showed 5am, so this incident must have happened at 4am, and I told my housemates everything in the morning. They were obviously freaked out, but we just didn't know what to make of it. To this day, I still don't know what to think about all of this. I mean, what were those things that hitched a ride with me that day? The smell and the tall figure calling my name and waking me up like that. All I know is that I saw something, heard something, smelt something, and I even felt them. Feel free to speculate on what all of this could be about. And if you have any insights, then please do let me know because we're now thinking about whether or not we should do something about whatever this is. For context, I've always been sensitive to the paranormal. For a long time, I thought that it was my parents' house that was haunted, then my dorm room, then my first apartment, and everyone since. It didn't take long, though, for me to figure out that it was something about me. The experiences come and go, sometimes not happening for years at a time, while other times multiple experiences happen in a week. Telling you the full story of my childhood experiences would have us here for hours, so I'll be skipping to adulthood for this story. So, the past few years I have had rare but significant experiences. Hearing someone walking around the school when I knew nobody else could be there. There's a sign-in sheet for after hours and I was the only name on it. I disarmed the alarm and reset it when I left and no one else in or out. I've been hearing furniture moving around the classroom, a door down from mine, and I could recall my colleague mentioning that she needed to do a desk change, but I hadn't even heard her come in. I thought that it was odd that she hadn't said hello, as I was drawing a, a new chalkboard picture for Halloween on my classroom door. I wanted to go and check, but I told myself that I was just being silly, and it was just my colleague. That is, until she walked into the school 20 minutes later. I've also been waking up to my bed shaking violently, almost as though people were on either side of the bed pulling the mattress back and forth. At first, I honestly thought that there may have been an explosion or something in a gas station down the street, or maybe an earthquake or something. In the morning, there was nothing on the news though. My landlord hadn't felt anything, and nor had my co-workers. Nothing in my room had fallen, so... I really had no evidence of my frightening experience. However, things have particularly ramped up in the past few months. You see, my mother passed away in April of 2023. A few months prior, a friend had given me the number to a psychic and upon learning of my mum's cancer, I felt like there was nothing to lose in giving it a try. She donated her fees to charity, so I thought that at least something good would come of it. That the things that she told me and the things that she knew about, I really couldn't explain. Things that never could have been found out on social media, for instance. While the main reason I contacted her was to ask her about my mum, and later communicate with her, hopefully, I also decided to ask about the attachment that I had. She confirmed to me the attachment and that it was, in fact, in her words, not human. It was a demon. She was also able to confirm that yes, I was sensitive, that I was capable of doing the same things as she could, if I began to learn about it and practice it. Apparently I was and am a psychic. 
once my sister called to inform me of our mother's passing at 3am. I became overwhelmed with a desire to see her, just to know if she was okay. It took me almost two weeks, but I think that she came to me. I could see her move from the foot of my bed to the head. She wasn't clear to the eye, but her voice, that was clear. She said my name, and that's all that she said. But it was her voice, her voice right next to my ear. Even after wanting and waiting for this, I was still in disbelief, to be honest. A moment passed, and I called out to her quietly, but I didn't get anything back. But since then, I have continued to work on remaining open to her. Unfortunately, I do not know how to remain open to only her, though. And this is where my problem begins. The demon, or whatever it is, decided apparently to take advantage of my openness. I've had a few small noises, lights flickering, and the ever-infuriating feeling of it clinging to my back. The last of which hasn't happened since my early 20s, like 10 years ago. Today, though, today was a totally new experience. You see, I had shared small experiences with my brother as a kid, but not with my sister, who was much older than me. She has never experienced anything before in her life, until today. I cannot express how glad I am that we have shared this experience, to be honest, because I'm not sure that I would have believed it wasn't all in my head if it wasn't for this, though my sister is certainly less glad. Anyway, this is what happened. So, I was driving from Edmonton to Fort McMurray for four and a half hours. Often I call someone to help me stay alert while driving. Just talking is enough. So I called my sister and we started chatting. Her cell phone wasn't working that well, so we switched to her landline and as we talked, the reception would sort of go spotty and the call would end. Rural Alberta doesn't really have the best coverage, but no big deal. I would just call her back and we would go back and forth like this. The problem didn't arise from poor coverage, though. It sounded as though my sister dropped the phone in a sink filled with water. Then came what I thought sounded like she was turning on the garburetor in the other side of the sink, on and off, on and off, all the while the phone still being underwater. And next, the animal noises. Or at least that's the closest thing that I can compare it to. An angry animal. The raspy, labored breathing. The sounds went back and forth, but the second time the breathing started, my sister ended the call. I had tried talking to her, but I couldn't hear anything but the strange sounds. Turns out, she was hearing the same thing. She heard those sounds, and she tried to get my attention, but to no avail. She said that she couldn't take it anymore after the breathing, and she had to hang up. This was new territory for even me, but for my sister, she was terrified. We continued our call until I was almost home and she had to pick her sons up from daycare. She is currently praying to not have any nightmares while I'm sharing this, but my dog is oddly unsettled all of a sudden and staring down the dark hallway as I'm sharing this. And boy do I hope that I don't start hearing those same noises. This is something that I've, well, never really told anyone about, but I've been thinking about it a lot lately, so I thought that I would. A few years back, 2015 to 2016, when I was 18 to 19 years old, I used to work at this little cafe inside of a car parts factory. It was basically a full-out but compact restaurant kitchen and lunchroom for the workers to eat there. And well, this one day I get a call from my best friend or co-worker. She's all kinds of upset because of this creepy new temp worker that made her feel severely uncomfortable by asking her a bunch of personal questions. Like what she drove, where she lived, if she was single, had any kids, when she got off work, etc. She didn't want to walk out to her car alone. Mind you, she was my age too, 18 to 19. And this dude was mid to late 30s at least if not already in his early 40s, and we're in Flint, Michigan, so we weren't about to take any chances. 
So I drive up to the parking lot, find her car, park next to it, and she has a security guard escort her out. We didn't see the guy then, but she described him to me and the guard, and that was that for pretty much a few days. Someone apparently found him and told him to stay away from her, and so he did. But then he met me. I knew exactly who he was as soon as he stepped up to the register to place his lunch order, just from the description that I had been given and by the creepy vibes that he was giving off. He pulled the same intense Q&A on me that he had done to my friend too, but instead of telling him to get lost or calling security or anything like that, I just told him a, a bunch of straight up lies. I told him that I drove a blue 2012 Honda Civic, which I knew for a fact that was one of the second shift manager's vehicles who always parked near the front of the building, and so I knew that it was going to be there until at least second shift ended at 11pm. I also told him that my shift ended at around 9.30, which was really the time that I'd usually slipped out for a cigarette break. So when 9.30 hit later that night, I walked outside to smoke my cigarette and I saw exactly what I was expecting to see. That stupid creep in the parking lot, close to the area that the Honda Civic was sitting. He was pacing back and forth behind two vehicles that were parked a few spaces down in the same row, playing on his phone the entire time. At one point, he glanced up and saw me staring at him, but I had my big leather winter coat on and a hat on as well, so I don't know if he recognized me at first from a distance or not. In any case, I finished my smoke and I went back inside and explained the entire situation to the security guards, one of which was the original guard that had escorted my friend out to her car a couple of days before, and they were dying laughing at the fact that I had pulled one over on this guy and had actually caught him being shady like that. I'm not sure exactly what they did about it because I went back to work after that, but I do know that they immediately went out and confronted him in the parking lot and that the guy was fired that same week. To this day, I still don't know what his intentions truly were, but it doesn't take a genius to figure out that it couldn't have been anything good. So ultimately, I guess the moral of the story is always have your friends' backs and trust your instincts because if you don't, you could end up cornered in a parking lot and possibly attacked or abducted by some creepy guy who asked one too many questions. So I believe that for a number of years, my family home built in the 1960s by my grandparents from my father's side has been haunted by several different paranormal entities over the course of decades, just because of major differences between the happenings themselves. It's a two-story house with my parents and I sleeping on the second floor, and my sister and grandparents sleep on the first floor. For me, however, this began around 15 years ago. My older sister was the first one afflicted, I think. In a short span of time, she began having constant sleep paralysis experiences, which I know aren't scientifically related to anything paranormal, but the folklore of my country relates them to a specific entity, known as a dark man, for a lack of a better translation to English, or what you might call a sleep paralysis demon, often thought of as a mischievous and perhaps even evil spirit behind this. At first, nothing was really done about it or thought about it, but these became so frequent that it started to weird out my parents a bit, as well as myself and my sister too. Soon, more things started happening in addition to this too, like her waking up in the middle of the night with something invisible pulling on her hair, causing her to freak out and call out for grandma, who with lightning speed ran over with a bottle of holy water, sprayed the place and prayed with my sister. Another time this happened, whatever was playing with her hair appeared to blow hair into her face, freaking her out even more. Grandma strikes again after this, of course, but the most shocking thing during the beginning of these happenings came when my mother, my sister and I were all in our living room watching TV, when suddenly, from a fully awake state, my sister shifted into the state of sleep paralysis. It took a couple of seconds for my mum and me to realise what was happening, when we noticed her shaking with her eyes open on the sofa, struggling to let out a sound. When she finally woke up, she let out a blood-curdling scream, crying and yelling at my mum and myself. It got me, it got me, why didn't you help me? 
She was visibly shook and pale, and my grandma arrived, of course, with her usual remedy, and even my father, a skeptic, walked out of my parents' bedroom, freaked out by her screams. My grandma remembered that, in the local law, if a person wants to be protected from the dark man, a piece of clothing from the person's father needs to be placed on them, serving as a shield. So we ended up tying my father's belt around her waist, and she went to sleep in my room, and as she usually did when things like this happened, she fell asleep. Still distraught and frightened, she asked me to go get her a glass of water, so I went to get some in a plastic cup from the water dispenser, and I give it to her. As my mum was still in the living room and my bedroom door, as well as my parents' bedroom door, was open, we all witnessed this next part. So as I approached my bedroom door, the plastic cup practically exploded in my hand, splitting on all sides, water bursting out of my hand. My mum got up immediately and came over, everyone looking in shock, absolutely speechless. My dad first thought that I had just dropped the cup, if I remember correctly, but... Upon closer inspection, the cup was obviously torn all around, in perfect straight lines, mind you, almost as if someone had cut it with a scalpel almost. Safe to say, though, not much sleeping had been done that night after that. Since that night, though, my mother and I had begun experiencing sleep paralysis too. For her, just a couple of times, and for me, even until this very day... Also, nightly noises started appearing in our house too, much different than the house settling, like moving chairs, clanking dishware, etc. Mainly on the second floor and especially when we weren't home. At one point, my grandma even searched the second floor, completely convinced that a burglar had to come in at some point, as she heard the old wardrobe in my parents' room open in addition to moving chairs, but when she reached the room... The wardrobe was open, but there was nobody in there. These incidents, though, prompted my sister to visit our local priest, and after explaining the situation, the happenings, and the nature of the haunting, the priest concluded that a lost spirit inhabiting our home was for some reason reaching out to my sister, wanting to become known. My sister was a little relieved after this, knowing that the spirit meant no harm. She even named the spirit Samuel, and... Well, now it was time to figure out what or who the heck Samuel actually was. There were a couple of theories. The first one concerned when my grandma was a little girl. On her way home from school, she had to pass through a cemetery every day, and one day she saw a pretty flowers on a grave, and she picked them, brought them home without telling anyone, and that very night, she woke up to an invisible force grabbing her by the leg, trying to drag her out of her bed. She felt as if she knew that whatever was dragging her wanted those flowers back and she woke her parents up and her mother said the same thing and they threw or returned the flowers the next morning. From that day on, she knew not to take anything from a graveyard ever again. It could have been that this entity remained attached to her and moved with her with her childhood home to our house when her and grandpa built it since it was only a couple of houses next door. The second one, though, was that the ghost was possibly my grandma's father, my great-grandpa, who I had never met, mind you, but this was a thought because before he died, he said to my grandma, if I'm gone and you ever hear something moving in the attic, know that it's me. Coincidentally, the attic eventually became the second floor of the house, where most of the noises and the cup incident happened too. It's also worth noting that my sister and I, we shared my room before she moved downstairs, so it could be connected somehow. I just truly don't know. But, whatever the case, other incidences soon followed. My mother once felt a strong press on her upper body when she was nearly sleeping, and thinking my dad put his arm around her with his full weight, she asked him to move the arm. And after she got no response, she asked again, complaining that it was hard to breathe. And she eventually had enough to the point of crying and yelled at him to stop, only to realize that he wasn't even turned towards her in the bed. He was turned to the other side and woke up wondering why she was screaming like that. She still remembers this vividly and it frightens her to this day and my dad remembers this too. 
On another night, I was playing PS2 games very late, and I had gone to bed without realizing that I forgot to turn it off, and my LED light-up joystick remained plugged in. I woke up in the middle of the night, and the TV was off, but thank God the PS2 was still working and the joystick was glowing. I couldn't stand the darkness with all this stuff going on, and I remember looking at the PS2 and the lights when suddenly the joystick just unplugs itself and in an instant total darkness swept through the room along with my panic. I quickly got up and I ran to the light switch and quickly turned it back on which remained turned on for the entire night after that. This was soon followed to once again late at night with me watching TV in the living room. Now the stairs are connected to our second floor at the very beginning of the living room and they're separated by a thin metal strip from the living room floor. And as I'm sitting there in total darkness, I suddenly hear footsteps coming up the stairs. I yell out to my sister, believing that she was going upstairs for a drink. But as I get no response, I realize that there isn't a chance that my sister would be coming up the stairs without turning the light on as... She never sleeps with the light off since this stuff started happening and to this very day, she's almost 30 years old, she's never slept without the light on. I sit up at the sofa, frozen, listening to each step as it comes closer to the top of the stairs. Finally, I hear that metal strip on the top of the stairs clanking as if somebody had stepped on it and at that, I just ran for the hills or should I say, from my parents' bedroom door, frantically banging on it and screaming for them to let me in. And I slept in their room for the rest of the night after that, completely terrified. But the most bizarre thing during that first round of hauntings happened during broad daylight, and it truly is just unexplainable in every way. My grandma and grandpa, sister and I, were all heading next door to my aunt's house that afternoon and my grandparents went before us as I was still doing something in my room and my sister was in the bathroom at the time. Now, it was always practice at our home that the last person to leave always takes the key from the inside of the front door and locks it up before heading out. So I run out of the house telling my sister that I'm going and she replies that she won't be far behind. I close the door behind me and... My sister tries to come out of the house, maybe half a minute after me, I would guess. She reaches for the door handle and realizes that the house is locked. The house was locked from the inside after I left and she remained the only person in there, meaning that nobody was there to lock it. She unlocked it as fast as she could and ran out after telling me that someone locked her inside we told everybody and we checked the locks, tried to reproduce this, but in the end, it was absolutely impossible for it to happen. The key had to be turned six times from the outside, mind you, for the door to be locked like that. The whole thing just made absolutely no sense. But this, this was the last major thing from that first round, I believe, and it was followed by mostly noises, which we learned to live with and accept. And as my sister accepted this Samuel, truly, no more incidences happened for a, a long time after that. At first, we didn't spread a word of this outside family and family friends, but when some time passed, I told my classmates about this, and one of them actually stayed the night after my birthday as he was intrigued by the noises and wanted to hear it for himself. My sister knew this and actually tried to pull a prank on us by knocking at our door late at night after the party, and... He and my other friend, who was also sleeping over, got scared by this, so my sister revealed herself, but the next time it happened, a couple of hours later, my friend woke me up to say that something was knocking on our door again. I opened the door, but this time, there was nobody there. My sister was in her room fast asleep too, I checked this, and he kept asking what the heck that was, and I just couldn't give him any answers. I was scared too, but I think I was just used to it by that point. He never slept over again and tells this story a lot as well as others who have slept there as well, but that was pretty much it for the chronicles of the first part of the paranormal experiences in my family home. After we accepted things, that they were just the way that they were, 
It all sort of watered down strangely for a couple of years and things like noises and sounds became less frequent. But a few years ago, some other things started happening, but the nature of them was different, as was the source, I think. Well, I believe. So I'll leave that for another time, but if you guys would like to hear this, then do let me know. I am going to preface this by saying that I am a believer in the paranormal and have had paranormal experiences just a, a few times before in my life. Some weird things have been happening at work recently though and I'm really not sure what to think about it, if it's paranormal or not. I guess this is where, well, doing this comes in, sharing it with you guys. So, I'm a female in my 20s and a full-time overnight worker at a hotel in my hometown. I've been working this position for about four months now and have experienced some odd, sometimes unexplainable things happening in the wee hours of the morning. I'm the only employee in the hotel working during my shift and have grown used to keeping my eyes and ears peeled as I'm basically security for the place, along with the front desk, and want to make sure that my guests are safe. Now, I truly can't tell if I'm convincing myself these experiences are paranormal or if they really are paranormal, but I want to share them here. So first, the drawer at the back desk where I sit and watch the security cameras, it will open on its own every five minutes or so. I assumed that it was because the drawer was loose and needed to be tightened. But when I asked maintenance if they noticed it happening during the day and could fix it, he and my manager said that they'd never seen it do that before. I'm not convinced that this is paranormal, obviously, but it's definitely odd when you add everything else. Our TVs in the lobby are kept at louder than 25-30 volume during the day and are muted at night. And one night, the TV unmuted itself and was set at 60 volume, startling me near to death as it was loud and abrupt. It happened once and never again, and... I don't think that my co-workers would raise the volume to 60 before muting it, as there's really no reason to do that. Again, I convinced myself that it was just a, a technological error, but it still left me uneasy. I once looked down the hall into the kitchen and for a split second, I could have swore that I saw a man standing there in the kitchen doorway. I even did a double take and when I looked back, he was gone. I convinced myself, though, that I mistook the shelf and the boxes for legs and a torso, but again, it left me uneasy. I was preparing breakfast in the kitchen one morning and heard a loud crash in the lobby, as if the large tin dish in the breakfast area had toppled over onto the ground. I rushed out of the kitchen to investigate what had happened, only to see that everything was in its place. Nothing had fallen, and I also saw nobody in sight. I couldn't really come up with a convincing reason for why this happened, and that one still puzzles me. But this morning at 1am, I returned to the back desk after using the restroom, and I heard a noise in the back hallway coming from the sort of housekeeping laundry room area. I slowly approached and turned on the light to see that one of the large dryers had started itself two hours after I started my shift, with the dryer door open. That has never happened since I've started working here and after confirming with my manager it has never happened before and again, I guess it could be explained by a technological error but it was really odd. Other things have happened too that I, I can't really remember off the top of my head but I can't tell if my belief in the paranormal combined with me being completely alone and sometimes scared I'll admit at work has created the idea of these instances being paranormal. Again, I don't know what to think, but I would really like to know what all of you guys think. About a decade back, I used to work at a brewery or a pub. It was set in a pretty big and old building from the early 1900s. I worked there for a couple of years, and most of the time it was pretty chill, but backbreaking at times too. On my time working there, I had two experiences that I can only describe as supernatural. 
The first one, it was a particularly late night and I was tasked with closing up the hangar and loading docks. Closing it up was basically making sure that there wasn't anything obstructing where the trucks would park, stacking up any loose crates, turning the lights off and locking it all up. I was about done too, so I turn off the lights and as I'm making my way to the door, a, a beer bottle comes rolling towards me from the dark between the tall stacks of the crates. It wasn't forceful or anything too, it sort of looked like someone gently placed it on the floor and rolled it towards me. I didn't think too much of it though, so I picked up the bottle and placed it inside a half-empty crate. I turned around and as I started walking, another bottle comes rolling from the same place. Then another one and tired and thinking that it was a co-worker trying to mess with me, I shout, Hey, alright, you got me, come on, I gotta close up. I expected to hear laughter or something, but instead, it was dead silent. I waited for a couple of minutes too, turned on my flashlight, I truly believed that somebody was there, and started looking around the stacks or the crates for what I thought it would be a giggling co-worker. But after searching each corner, eventually I just had to give up. I admit that I was a little bit weirded out at this point, but... I just picked up the two bottles from the ground and placed it in the same crate as the first one. I turned off my flashlight and shouted at the darkness, All right, I'm looking up. See you tomorrow. Just as I finished saying that, a crate full of bottles fell from one of the stacks and landed two feet from me, glass shards and beer exploding absolutely everywhere. And that, I have no idea how it happened. The next day I told my boss about it though and he said that it was probably a rat. The thing is though is that those crates when full probably weigh 20 pounds at least. How a rat could throw it like that is just impossible. Talking to my co-workers too, they told me that they've also experienced weird stuff during the closing hours down there. Anyway... My second experience happened again when I was closing this place, and this time I was closing the pub. So when closing the pub, the last thing that you usually do is restock the walk-in freezer. The freezer is probably just as old as the building itself, to be honest, and it sits underground, right beneath the bar. I was down there filling that enormous thing with kegs and crates, and being a very old freezer from a time when safety wasn't a big concern, the thing doesn't open from the inside, no handle, nothing, just a, a flat plain steel door. So I did what I always did when I had to go inside that thing. I put a keg securing the door open. And I was about halfway through that task when I hear the door slamming shut. I rushed towards the door but it was actually locked shut. I started pounding on it but the only other person there was my boss in the office, two floors above me, probably with the door closed. I tried my phone, but since I'm locked underground inside of a steel and lead box, I had no service. I was wearing only jeans and a t-shirt, so things were getting chilly pretty quickly. My face was going numb and my hands were getting stiff, and I made a blanket out of cardboard, but it was doing very little keeping the cold at bay. The only reason I didn't freeze to death, though, was because I had a date with a regular and she went there looking for me. She asked my boss where I was and when he couldn't find me, he went to the basement and found me inside the freezer. I was there for about 45 minutes when he found me and I was starting to consider writing a letter to my parents and drinking myself to sleep. My boss, he installed a chain to keep the door open after that, but I refused to ever walk in that death trap ever again. But the weirdest part was that the keg that I had holding the door open, it was now at the other side of the room when I got out. It was a full steel keg, mind you. Not something that can just slide away, let alone quietly. Anyway, in the end I, I stopped working there shortly after for unrelated reasons, but it's something that has always stuck with me. Back in 2018, I had just turned 20 and wanted to splurge for my birthday, so I invited a few friends to paintball, including my old friend Rain, her boyfriend Jackie, my boyfriend who I'll call Fred, and my best friend Evie. 
We all met at a nearby mall and crammed into Rain's car. She had offered to drive us all. I don't know if this was connected, but my boyfriend said something weird too. We were on the highway when he turned to Rain and said, Hey, can you slow down? I have a bad feeling that something bad is going to happen. Which was obviously strange to ask, but Rain obliged and slowed down to the speed limit. She was going 10 over, which is permitted where I live. And we made it to the paintball place, without any issues too, and proceeded to have a great time. Fred even shot me in the spine, which hurt up until the next day. Anyway... Eventually it was nearing the end of the day and we were all tired, so we all agreed that it was time to go but Rain suggested that we all book a motel room and spend the night together. But Fred and Jackie said no to this and they were both tired and wanted to go home which left us girls to hang out instead. So we found a pretty rundown motel for cheap and spent a few hours watching horror movies and halfway through the second movie we started to feel like there was a, a presence in the room with us but we just chalked it up to the horror movies, obviously. Now, a fun fact about Evie is that she has an attachment, a shadow figure that has been haunting her for, for years, her and her family. It started with her mom and weirdly got passed down to her, apparently. And that night, when feeling the presence, Evie nor I thought that it was her ghost friend. Like I previously said, we just thought that it was our nerves from the horror movies. After we had finished the final film though, we all decided that it was best to get to bed. The presence that we were feeling was getting a little too much for us. The air felt heavy and whatever was in the room with us felt angry and we assumed sleeping would just help eliminate the feeling of being watched and the overall nasty gut feeling that we got. Evie and I shared a bed while Rain took up the other. I usually have a hard time falling asleep in a new environment but... At that moment, I was having a more challenging time than usual. The odd time that I did manage to doze off, I would always have these strange dreams of swirling shadows. And no actual shape to them, just sort of whirlpools of darkness. On the other hand, Rain seemed like she had a fantastic dream. She was moaning and making a lot of noise overall. Well, that mindset changed when she shot up and gasped for air. I sprung up myself and asked her what was wrong, and that's when she started telling me about her dream. In her dream, she was being pursued by a shadow figure. She recalled how terrified she felt, hence the moaning, and no matter how far she ran, the thing would always catch up to her. Eventually, it knocked her to the ground like it was fed up with the chase and wrapped its fingers around her throat. She couldn't breathe and started thrashing around, trying to break free from its grasp. But nothing worked in the end and Rain could feel herself dying. She thought that that was the end, but luckily she woke up before she died. And as she's telling me this, I turned on the light. Evie had woken up at this point and was listening to her retell her nightmare as well. And during her recollection, I noticed red marks forming on her neck. Same as her wrists, arms and legs. Just about any visible patch of skin had some form of a mark on it. I pointed it out to her once she finished her story and asked if she usually woke up with bruises and marks on her like that. Rain looked somewhat startled and said no. Weirdly enough too, some of these marks looked like handprints. And with that, the three of us decided that it was probably time for us to leave now and we hastily packed our bags and piled into Rain's car. We started to feel better once we were far from the motel Evie and I began to tell her about the shadow figure that haunted Evie and I told her that it had once threatened my life in a dream too but never physically attacked us or anything. Rain nervously laughed it off and I took that as a cue to just drop the subject. It was getting a little bit awkward. Rain and I really don't talk anymore and I moved across the country and we sort of fell out of touch but I'll never forget the look of fear as she recalled her dream to us that night. That shadow figure still haunts Evie and I, but it has never tried to strangle someone in a dream, or at least not that we know of. So, we don't know if it was the same thing, or if there was something else going on in that room. This event happened around the mid-90s. It's a situation that I often think on and 
realized just how lucky I was. I was 18 and I had found a new bar called the Aqua Lounge. It was an interesting place, actually set up in an old Napoleonic fort on the south coast of the UK. I was quite into uh, amphetamines at the time, as were a lot of youths back then, and we would use it to dance all night. And one evening, a DJ that worked there started talking to us. He went by the name of Paul and seemed affable and friendly. He invited myself and two other friends back to his for an after party. Initially, we refused as we had started talking to some girls and things were looking promising. But he insisted and suggested that they come along too. He gave us a lift in the back of his van and we arrived at his place. I remember seeing lots of UV paintings and his house had a real party house sort of vibe. He offered us drinks and we drank them. Now being on amphetamines, you're invariably chatty and energetic. However, I felt almost stuck in the chair that I was in. The girls that we had brought with us, in fact, said that we seemed quiet and boring. I was wide awake, but my body just wouldn't move for some reason. The girls seemed unaffected by this. Our host kept insisting on giving us drinks, but I refused as one of the beers that I was given seemed to last ages. But before long the girls left and the host started trying to hypnotize us for fun. This didn't work and after a while in the early hours of the morning we all just left but the memories of where he lived and the journey home are a bit sketchy for me. In any case a, a few years later I was talking to an old friend that I had reconnected with and we discussed the now closed aqua lounge and what it was like there. I shared my experience with my friend and said that it was just odd how it was there. And my friend then told me that the DJ, Paul, was apparently now in prison and that a friend of his had been drugged by him and when he woke up, Paul was apparently doing all sorts of stuff to him in the worst way. I fully believe that we were to be his next victims and if it wasn't for the amphetamine in my system, the drug that he'd used on us would have rendered us unconscious and at his mercy rather than just locking us to the chairs. I still think back on that night and feel grateful that I wasn't his next victim. And in the end, it turns out that the club was shut down due to a, a spat of drugging incidences that apparently occurred there. So, I've never really shared anything like this before and am naturally a, a scientifically minded and rational person who comes from a place of skepticism. Basically, I'm trying to get some perspective on what happened and explore all avenues because, to be quite honest, I'm dumbfounded. So me and my two children were visiting my parents for dinner and they live in the middle of the woods. It's my family home where I grew up and about halfway through the evening, the kids were watching TV inside and my parents were busy talking in the other room so I went out to my dad's detached shop to practice pool for a little while. I let them know where I was going before I did this obviously and I'm an avid pool player and he has a table so I figured I would run some drills for around 30 minutes. After I finished up I walked out the door to go back into the house and it was almost dark at this point. Still some light but not much. I was about halfway to the house when I heard a child's voice in the woods. I couldn't understand what it said but it was clear as day and sounded like it was maybe, I don't know, a hundred yards away? I stopped and looked in the direction that it came from, trying to see if maybe it was one of my kids and that they had went outside without me knowing or something. Then I heard the voice again and it literally said my name like it was calling me. However, it didn't really sound like one of my kids, so I yelled back and got no answer. I walked towards the woods a little, expecting to see who it was, but I never saw anything or anyone. I stood there for a while, calling before. I just immediately went inside to check on my kids to make sure that one of them hadn't wandered off into the woods. And when I got inside... They were still sitting in the same spot watching TV. I asked my mum if they were outside and she said that they never actually went out there. And now, for some perspective, my parents lived in the middle of nowhere. 
There's no house within a mile of them, and no one else around has kids who would know me by name. And, to be honest, I'm genuinely creeped out by this. I'm wondering, has anyone else experienced anything similar to this? When I was 18, there was a gas station outside of town and it was this rinky-dink little place where the cashier sold cigarettes to you if you were in pull-ups and being carried by your mum. They just didn't care is what I'm getting at and I pulled up one day and walked out with a pack of Marlboros and a Red Bull for some gaming time because I was itching to die young and fast, right? But I got in my car and turned it on. For some context too, I weighed about 108 and was 5'4". I'm tiny and I was a scrawny teenager in a sketchy gas station parking lot, but in the middle of the day, mind you. Anyway, I always keep my car doors locked and as soon as I'm in my car, the first thing that I do, besides check the back seat before I even get in, is lock my doors. I do that and a split second later, I hear my passenger side door jiggling. This guy in his maybe 20s to 30s, blonde hair, stubble, normal looking dude, was yanking on my door handle like he knew me, like I was his Uber. I'd never seen him before and this man had no business trying to get into my car. I'm just in shock and watch as he taps my window and points down like he wants me to unlock it or roll down my window or something. I could tell though that he was bad news and I wasn't stupid so... I threw my car in reverse and I pulled away. He looked frustrated and disappointed, but I never saw him or the van that he was standing at again too. I was too stunned to get a license plate and even if I thought that I could report it, I was buying cigarettes and didn't want to get in trouble. I didn't even smoke them in the end. I bought them for the thrill and gave the stale cigs to a stoner friend who didn't use them for nicotine. But I can still see him in my head though, tapping on the window like that. It was freaky and just completely out of the blue. I was on the highway too when I realized that I'd been so scared that I even forgot to put my seatbelt back on. I guess it just goes to show that stuff like this can happen at any place and at any time. So, a few minutes ago, I saw a picture of what appeared to be a, a cult or activity from them or something, and looking back at that picture, it stirred up a, a not-so-distant memory for me. For context, I visit my mum every month, and she lives a few states away from me. I was driving back home from visiting my mum, and was less than an hour or two from the Oklahoma-Texas state line. Driving, I enter a small town that I have no knowledge of. The only thing that I remember clearly about it though was that there were a few medicinal marijuana dispensaries and it had a lot of old buildings, almost all of them with large old fences and gates. Weirdly, I can't seem to find this on the map, but if any of you guys have any ideas then please do let me know. So, I drove into town already feeling creeped out. The residents would sort of shuffle about and stare and... There were very few new buildings, but that wasn't the creepy part. You see, on almost every sidewalk corner and road, there were dead dogs all wearing a leash and a collar. No blood, no slashes, bites or gunshot wounds or anything. Just dead dogs everywhere. I stopped at one of the traffic lights in town and took in the greater picture. The people, as I said, just sort of shuffled and just seemed wrong. But then the horror hit me. There were 20 plus dead dogs easily. And from what I could make out, there was just no logical reason or conclusion for this to happen. One or maybe two would make sense, I suppose, but it was like 20 plus. In fact, almost every lawn there was a dead dog there. But not just one breed in particular too. It varied from miniature poodles up to Rottweilers and Labradors. I also noticed that nobody seemed to care. Mind you, and again, it was not just one dog. There was no way of ignoring it. But again, they all had leashes and collars, and I just cannot emphasize enough how weird this was. 
that they were actually everywhere and they were on street corners, yards, corners, middle of the road, parking lots. I drove through the town with no issues, mind you, but I attempted to find the town before sharing this and I've still had no luck finding it, which is weird because I should be able to find it easily. I mean, it's on a, a common route that I've taken before. The next time I go up to see my mum, I'm going to attempt to track down this town and possibly give all of you guys an update. My theory is that it's either a cult or a major meth or drug epidemic in that town. But if you have any information or ideas of where this actually happened and how I could find it again, then please do share it because I do plan to go back. So for context, I'm 26 and I met my stalker at the ages of 14 or 15. When I was 14, I decided to take a ballroom dance classes at one point. That was kind of normal for teenagers in my generation in my country, but there you had to change partners each song, so every girl would dance with every boy. And in my group, that consisted of mostly teens between 14 to 17, there was a really tall, almost 2 meters, 21 year old, old guy, his name was Philip. We had a nice chat the times that we danced, but he seemed sort of weird. And because I was young and naive, and that's how I normally made friends, I told him where I lived when he asked me. And so, the stalking began. At the time, I didn't realize that it was stalking, I just thought that he had too much time on his hands and that it was just annoying. But Philip would ride on his bike from his home, he lived one town over, to my house and ask if I wanted to spend time outside with him and play. After doing that for a few times, I asked my parents to tell him that I just wasn't home when he would come over. Both my parents and I were very oblivious about his actions for a very, very long time too. At one point in time, the stalking ended for a few weeks and Philip also didn't come to dance classes. At that time, I became a part of a friend group of a boy I fancied. For some months, he had a girlfriend, but they split soon after and I became his girlfriend. Unfortunately, though, Philip was also friends with the best friend of my boyfriend, so he was also part of that group. They told me Philip was in a, a mental hospital, apparently, and in the span of his stalking, Philip had actually been put into a mental hospital multiple times, and every time that he was... To be honest, I was kind of thankful because then I at least had some peace. But when I was 16, my family and I had to move because our landlady had thrown us out. She wanted to live in the property herself. So we moved one town over and unfortunately, we began living two streets apart from my stalker. And every time Philip was out of the hospital, he would be at my house again. It was not as often, but still, it was enough to be annoying. At my father's birthday though, he rang again, and because my family had guessed, they told me to open the door, and there he was, looming over me like a dark, menacing shadow man. I told him to leave, and I tried to close the door, but he blocked it. So, I was standing there, afraid, sort of begging him to leave, and at one point, I even ran inside to get my dad to send him away, but my dad said, he's your friend, so it's your problem. So I went back to the door, and again, I basically pleaded that Philip please leave. At one point, he was sort of kneeling and sitting on my doorway, and after almost two hours, he finally left. It was obvious to me at that point, too, that, and I finally realized what type of behavior it was, that he was a stalker and he was fixated on me. The next day I sat down with my parents and I told them that I was afraid of Philip and my dad also apologized to me for putting me in that situation and not helping me. The next time Philip came to my house, my dad was there and told him that I do not want any contact with him and so he left. And after a few more incidences like that, he stopped showing up at my door and honestly I thought that I had got rid of him. But every time I started to live happily, started to forget my fear of him, a letter, an email, or a gift showed up and would send me straight back into my fears. At 20, 
I was out of school and to pass the year I had to wait to start my job and I worked in a grade school in a voluntary sort of position after school care club for grade schoolers. After a month or two my mum woke me up in the morning and she told me to get dressed because she had apparently called the cops. Apparently Philip was again every single morning at our door and had even asked for me and my parents didn't tell me so I wouldn't get scared again but Finally, after the cops told Philip three times to leave, and he ignored them, mind you, they arrested him and he screamed and screamed my name and that he was burning for me and that the cops hurt him and he just carried on like crazy. My parents and I were standing in the kitchen listening. The situation was so absurd and so much for me that I just started laughing sort of hysterically. We filed a report at the police for stalking and trespassing, but... The officer said that they couldn't really do anything because he hadn't hurt me physically. We tried to get a restraining order too, but in the end it didn't go through and a week later, Philip had snuck into our garden and like in a movie, he threw rocks at my window. Throwing rocks at a girl's window is not romantic. It's creepy. Don't do it, guys. But idiot me opened the window and didn't see anything until it clicked and I ran downstairs and told my dad that he was in the garden again. This time he escaped. A week after that I was in the kitchen cooking when Philip rang the doorbell again and because we have no way of seeing who was at the door I opened it and there he was again telling me that he missed me and saying that he had peeked through the blinds of the windows in the living room the past week to see if I was there. But my parents weren't home at that point. If they had been, I would have ran, but like this, I had to swallow my fear and stand in the doorway listening to Philip talk until my boyfriend, different boyfriend, he came over. I had sent him an SOS SMS and he was on his way. After my boyfriend arrived, he told Philip to leave and he did. Philip mentioned in passing though that he now also has a girlfriend. And after that, I didn't see Philip again for a long time. But a friend told me that he was taken by the men in white coats because he had believed that his mum was possessed by the devil or something. I was glad to see the end of him, but man, that was a shock. It wasn't until two years later too when I got a letter from court. I was apparently a witness and I was told to attend in the case of the assault of Philip. Apparently after coming out of the mental hospital, he had a fight with his girlfriend and hit her and... Because she was scared, she played dead apparently. Philip called an ambulance and the police finally had something against him. After the hearing, he was admitted again to a mental hospital and I finally got a restraining order and he was ordered to stay at least 30 meters away from our property. I was really glad to hear this too because the restraining order also implied that if he broke any of the requirements, he would go to jail. And so... Finally, it was over. Two years ago, I also moved out of my parents' house. And I'm sharing this only now because I believe that I'm actually seeing him again. But it can't be. He doesn't know where I live and he also hasn't shown up at my parents' house. But I don't know. I think that I've seen him again when I've left my house a few times. I think that I just need reassurance that it's not him again and... I need to find a way to be safe at my home. If you guys have any ideas or any way that I can help myself, then please let me know. When I was 16, I decided to throw a small Halloween party. My dad agreed to leave me the house and he was staying at for the day or night and went to stay in another town about 30 minutes drive away. It's worth noting too that the house was very isolated, abandoned looking and pretty old as well. It was a small village and there were barely any neighbours. But around mid-afternoon, one of my friends came to help me prepare and others were expected to arrive at night. Looking back, two 16-year-old girls alone in an isolated house was always going to be a bad idea. But at some point, we were sitting on the couch chatting and suddenly we heard a, a loud bang and the living room got very dark. We turned around and saw that the outside heavy wooden shutters had been slammed shut. 
We instantly freaked out because it was a nice sunny day and there was absolutely no wind. So we knew that someone was outside and trying to scare us or watching us or something. We ran into the next room to hide and we saw some shadows through the windows of that room walking around the house. At this point, we were terrified too because the front door wasn't locked and the bathroom window was broken so the entire house was easy to break into. On top of all of that as well, the only place that we had service was upstairs in the corner room. Long story short though, we made our way to that room and I called my dad for help. Shortly after though, we heard the front gate creaking open and shutting and we heard a car drive away. When we finally went back downstairs, the cops were there because my dad had sent them but they never found anyone or cared much really anyway since no one had been clearly seen and nothing had been stolen. But what's really weird to me is that the house was so easy to break into but they never actually came in it seems, simply just watched us and walked around the house. But what shocked me the most perhaps is what happened a few days later. I was in that house with my dad and a friend of his came to see him and at some point he came in the living room and smiled at me weirdly and said crazy how dark it gets here when the shutters are closed and I just remember my blood freezing when I heard that. I never saw that guy again and I never stayed in the house alone again but sometimes I think that maybe maybe we got lucky that nothing happened that night. This happened two years ago but I've been struggling to sleep tonight and I just keep thinking about it so I'm gonna share it here. I was 17 and my family had just moved in with my mum's boyfriend into a house that he had just finished building. It's interesting to know too that my mum and her boyfriend, they had been dating for two years prior to this and he was a really cool dude. My first night in the new house sure was a night though. The whole house had that feeling of uneasiness going on. It's also important to note that prior to this, I'd never experienced sleep paralysis. But when I woke up in the morning, I couldn't move and I could also hear a dog breathing in my ear and I could even feel its breath. So sleep paralysis, right? Not the vibe that anyone wants, but still explainable. But well, it just got worse. Every single night I would wake up completely paralyzed with what sounded like a dog breathing in my ear again. It kept escalating and one night I, I heard a dog running around on the floor. It was that sort of distinct claws and cement sound that dogs make and then eventually it got so bad that I was waking up multiple times a night to the feeling of something crawling into bed next to me and laying right up against me. I would also have a reoccurring nightmare of a black dog with six segments like a, a centipede talking to me. It was terrifying at first but it became so frequent that in the end it just stopped freaking me out anymore. Still, it's just sleep paralysis, right? Well, at one point the conversation came up about the history of the property and according to mum's boyfriend, a man had actually shot six dogs and then himself on the property. That definitely began to freak me out a bit. Me and my mum discussed all of this and apparently she'd been seeing stuff in the house too. She always complained sounds would come from her room and that we couldn't figure out the cause of it. But the worst encounter was probably when we were sitting at the kitchen table and we heard what sounded like rummaging through her closet. The closet shares a wall with the kitchen and the walls are thin so you could hear it. But it definitely wasn't a, a small animal or anything. It was like things were being picked up and moved and sort of thrashed about a bit. So naturally I get my scrawny butt in there armed with none other than a, a can of beans and the second that I announced that I have a gun, a can of beans though, the sound stopped. But then we noticed that there was a box taken off the shelf and it was now set in the middle of the floor. Now, you know how I said that my mum's boyfriend was a cool dude? Well, he also started getting weird and his behaviour kept escalating too until eventually we just had to leave in the middle of the night. I haven't gotten sleep paralysis since then too and hopefully 
I won't ever again. Ever since I was three years old, I knew one girl and her name was Emma, and because we were in the same group in kindergarten, later we attended the same school too. But we were never really close until we turned nine or ten, because we got into the same group of friends and soon we became best friends, not surprising for that age too. We'd hang out a lot, literally spent all the free time with each other that we could, I knew that Emma had problems at home too. Her mother was an alcoholic and an addict. And even though she denied it all the time, we just knew it. Most of the time we would spend our time together on the streets. However, rarely we would stay at my place when it was raining or during storms and blizzards. But we never entered her apartment when someone was at home. And even then we never really stayed for longer than 10 minutes. My mother suspected that she was stealing stuff pair of golden earrings went missing and we never found them again and just asked me to be more careful around her and eventually I noticed what my mother meant. Emma would come up with some crazy excuses to stay in my apartment like saying that if we got under the rain that she would catch a cold during her period and in the future she wouldn't be able to give birth due to that or something. I wasn't a dumb kid but decided to not point it out but one summer afternoon, I decided to bring up the topic of Emma's family again. She took me to her room and nobody was there. Everything went normal, so we started hanging there more often. But I noticed a lot of empty alcohol bottles and syringes around, but it wasn't my place to pry, so I let it be. But a few days after that, when we entered, I noticed two extra pairs of shoes that weren't there before, and when we left the door frame, I saw a woman and a man sitting in a kitchen smoking. I knew that Emma didn't have a father. He died when she was two or so, so I assumed that it was her mother's friend or something. The person said, is that and my name? You've changed a lot. Such a, a pretty face. I was so weirded out as she and that man stared at me intently, eyeing up my body and face. I was ten, so I only understood that later, how creepy it was. But I'm pretty sure that I've never actually met her mother before, so probably she saw me in kindergarten albums or something, but after that encounter, Emma started acting really strange, asking about my parents' full names, where exactly they work, whether I have extended family or not, persuading me to go to abandoned places. She literally dragged me to her place several more times where I met her mother and that man again. Weird comments too especially about my body and face, happened every time. I told my mother about Emma's behavior. I didn't tell about the weird stuff with her mother, and she banned me from hanging out with Emma completely at that point. The important note, too, is that after me and Emma stopped talking, she transferred to another school by demand of her mother. Anyway, it was a regular morning a month or two after I had stopped talking with Emma. I was heading out to school when... Suddenly an old beaten up car pulled up near me and a woman came out of it. I couldn't see her face clearly due to the scarf around her face and I assumed that she was just a passenger getting out of the car. So I continued my way towards the school. However, I haven't even made more than a step when she firmly grabbed my arm. She started saying something about my mother being in hospital and that I needed to go with her and... Her voice seemed sort of familiar and the rest of the face too. She also said full names of my parents and that she's related to me from my uncle's side. She said his name too. I started to freak out and started denying her demand to get in the car so she grabbed my shoulder, placed her palm on my mouth and dragged me to the car. That's when I saw that the driver was that man from Emma's place. I bit the woman's hand as hard as I could, thrashed until she finally let go and then I ran back home as quickly as I could. My mother came home furious after she was alerted that I never got to school but she quickly calmed me down when she saw my state. My clothes were torn on the sleeve, my arm was heavily bruised and I was sobbing. I was never an emotional kid, rarely showed even mild emotions so... This was completely unexpected from her. 
I explained everything that happened and she showed me all the photos of relatives and asked if I recognized that woman and I didn't. My mother never really said a word to me about it after that and I think we just sort of pretended that it never happened. But today, I stumbled across Emma's Facebook and there was a photo of her mother and in that photo was that same scarf from that day. I denied the possibility that it was her throughout my whole childhood, but here it was, a proof that makes it impossible to lie to myself anymore. I need to let it out because my mother never got me any psychological help after this and I just bottled it up. But I have to ask, why did Emma's mother do that? Did Emma know about it? I guess that I'll probably never know. When I was 12, I had some trouble sleeping due to stress from a major move. My family and I relocated to Perth, Australia. I no longer live there, and this was many years ago, but I would sit in bed with a small nightlight on, thinking until eventually I just got tired enough to fall asleep. Now, one night, when everybody else was asleep, I heard a, a strange sound, and it was a voice saying, what the F is going on? in a really irritable way. I didn't recognize the voice, but it sounded like a young man. But the strange thing was that the voice kept repeating this phrase on and on, sort of like a recording. Just thinking about it too makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, but I didn't know where the voice was coming from. It sounded like it was outside, but because it sounded like a, a cheap recording and because I thought that whatever speaker was used to produce the sound could not be that strong, I ended up surmising that the sound must be originating from directly outside of my window. When I came to that conclusion too, I just panicked. I mean, who could be the perpetrator? My neighbors to one side were sweet old people, the house on the other side was still under construction and completely vacant at night, and it was way too far from my window to be making the noise. Initially, I tried to ignore the sound, thinking that maybe my mind was playing tricks on me, but it persisted. Eventually, it got too much, and I bolted out of bed and burst into my parents' room. They woke up to me telling them that there was a creepy sound outside, but suddenly, it stopped, and nobody else heard it. To this day, I still don't have any answers. I admit that it may have just been an auditory hallucination, but nothing like it has ever happened to me before or since then. Which makes me think that there was someone or something outside of my window that night, replaying that recording over and over again for who knows what reason. This happened probably five or six years ago now. I must have been 18 at the time. For starters, I lived in a city where neighborhoods and forests kind of blended together. There are plenty of wooded areas where people go to have bonfires and parties here, and one night, after discovering that all of our usual spots were crowded with people, I suggested that we go to a spot that I had been to a few times nearby. I'd been there multiple times, but only ever during the day. The street where we park is maybe 200 feet from the tree line. It's your average middle class neighborhood, nothing crazy is really known to happen here, but we walk in, start a bonfire, and we're all having a good time. Some of us are drinking and smoking a bit, myself included. About 45 minutes pass, and I'm a little bit intoxicated now, but nothing major. And over the sound of our quiet music and my friends talking, I suddenly hear something a bit odd. I can't make out what it is, so I figure maybe that I'm just hearing things. Maybe another 10 minutes or so goes by too, and I hear it again. A little better this time, but it still sounds relatively far away, but it sort of sounds like Velcro tearing. I stop and just kind of sit there trying to listen while my friends carry away laughing and talking. They haven't seemed to have noticed yet, and that's when I heard a, a sound that I was very familiar with. A zapping noise, like you would hear from a taser. 
Very brief, but it was unmistakable, and upon hearing it, my stomach drops, and I started looking around a little frantically. My girlfriend at the time was first to notice my distress, and she asks me what's wrong, and I explain, and she immediately starts worrying. She gets my friends to quiet down a bit, and we all just sit there and listen for a bit. Then, we all hear it, an electrical zap, brief again, but we all know that sound. We all start panicking a bit and we quickly put out the fire while asking each other what that was or where exactly it was coming from. We're all obviously scared to walk out. It's only maybe a five minute walk to the street but it's incredibly dark. We all muster the courage to finally walk the path out though and we don't run into anyone, thankfully. We finally get to the street and start walking to our cars, nervously sort of laughing and relishing being under the street lamps again but I see him first. He's walking towards us, not at us, just sort of walking in the direction that we just came from, slightly to the right of us, and he's holding a, a stick of some sort. It scared me at first, but for a brief second, I calmed myself. It was a, a pretty safe neighborhood after all that I knew really well, and it was really common to see people out walking at night. But then I noticed that he's looking right at us, and that stare is burned into my mind. We pass each other. My friends and I are all silent now as we're having this stare down with this random person. And that's when it happened. He doesn't break eye contact, holds up the pole and smiles this creepy smile. His eyes are wide open. At the end of the stick lights are bright and that same zapping sound happens again, much louder this time. He was holding a cattle prod. We live in a city, no farmland nearby, no reason really to have one, so it was really strange. My friends and I are silently soiling ourselves as he walks past us, maybe 20 feet away and goes straight into the woods without a flashlight or anything. We all got into our cars and we just peeled out of there after that. And we obviously never went back to that spot ever again. I worked at a store that was very close to my house, so I walked home every day. The map of this story is, there's my job, my friend's job, a traffic light, a small park, another traffic light, three abandoned stores, and finally a gas station. The only busy part of this route is the gas station. Now, One day I was leaving work and it was starting to get dark. When I left, there was an employee fixing the electrical box of the store that my friend works at. I glanced at him, not thinking anything of it, and waved to my friend. She smiled through the glass door, and I continued on my way. It was just a, another normal day. When I was exactly in the middle of the park, though, I glanced quickly over my shoulder, because I'm an anxious woman, and saw the electrician who I just saw walking behind me. Everything I'm going to tell you now happened very quickly, but when I looked back again, his eyes were fixed on me, and he had no expression on his face. All the alarm bells were going off in my head, so I started walking at a faster pace, more out of paranoia than real fear, I guess, but I looked again, and this time more slowly, and I noticed that his steps increased in speed, just like mine. His expression had also changed to anger and impatience, like a hunter frustrated because the little rabbit ran too fast. I think deep down our survival instincts know when someone wants to do something bad to us just by looking at them. I hadn't started running yet, but the park, which was actually small, suddenly got much bigger. I don't know if when I looked back a third time my fearful expression gave me away, but instead of walking, he began to almost run and walk at the same time, his strides becoming so long that it was awkward to look at. And so, I ran. I had seen this a thousand times on the news. The park was empty and it was just me and him. And I knew what he wanted to do. I had my phone in my hand, but the adrenaline was telling me to keep running and running. I ran to the light and crossed the street, still not daring to look back. Maybe he was right behind me. And what would I do if he got to me? I thought after arriving at the abandoned stores that he would have given up, so I looked back one last time. 
And there he was, still not running though, just walking super fast in a really weird way. The adrenaline made me run even faster and when I looked again after a while, he had suddenly stopped. The guy just stood there, his angry expression also fading away. His face looked blank. It was like he was staring into nothing. But his eyes, his eyes were still fixed on me. At this point, I was already approaching the gas station and he was just a silhouette that didn't move. My heart was still racing and my hand was shaking so badly that I could barely type the password to my cell phone. I kept walking and looking back every second, but he didn't move an inch. I started to get paranoid thinking that maybe he really was an employee, that maybe I was imagining things, that he wasn't really following me. It's like our brain starts to justify the situation so you stop suffering or something, but when I was already at the end of the gas station and the adrenaline was slowly decreasing, my boss called me and asked if I had arrived home yet. I obviously said no and he said that my friend next door was worried about me because there was a, a crazy man pretending that he had tools in his hand and pretending that he was fixing the power box. She was too scared to tell him to stop and just watched his weird mimicking for a while, but when I passed by, he turned and followed me as if he was literally waiting for me. My friend was so scared that she tried to record the man in case something happened and was ready to call the police. And after that episode, I changed the route that I did for work and even started to use a bike too. I guess the moral of this story is... Don't forget to always stay alert of your surroundings. I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't realized quickly enough that he was following me. He would have reached me in seconds, in fact. And I shudder at the thought of that. Two years ago, my mother and I were home alone for a few days because my father and my brother were traveling together. On a Friday, I got home from work at around 1pm. My mother came home at 5pm, opened my bedroom door and said hello. We had dinner together and then we each went to our individual rooms. Her room was next to mine. As it was Saturday, I slept in the afternoon and my mother had already left the house when I woke up. As soon as I opened the bedroom door, something on the floor caught my eye though. There were three scratches on the floor, one coming out of my room right in line with my door frame and the other two going down the hall and heading towards my mother's room. They looked like scratches from shoes I would guess and I thought that it was strange because looking at the scratch coming from my room the door had to be open enough to pass the threshold and that had to have happened while I was sleeping which also made no sense. But the order of the scratches didn't make sense either because it looked like the person had left my mother's room, gone down the hall and turned abruptly into my room, or the other way around. But the scratches were long, the kind that sports shoes would make, and the chances my mother had had those shoes on indoors were like zero. Shoes are banned indoors altogether. When my mother arrived while I was having lunch, I asked what those scratches on the hallway floor were. She turned irritated and questioned, What do you mean? What are they? You made it, didn't you? The burger that I was eating felt suddenly like sand in my mouth. I said no, that I thought that they were hers. We both got up at the same time and walked out into the hallway and stared at the scratches. And then she said something that really made me freak out. By the way, I didn't clean it because I'd already cleaned up the mud you brought into the house and... I got irritated and thought that I'd at least leave these here for you to clean up. I almost fell backwards. Mud? I asked. She gave me a nervous smile and said that there were small concentrations of mud in some places in the house, that she had found them in the morning on the porch, in the living room and in the hallway too. But I hadn't even been on the porch that day. A shiver instantly went through my whole body because... I knew that someone had entered our house, and the worst thing was that they had opened my door, my bedroom door, and had watched me sleeping. In 
2014, I moved to England from Canada to gain work or travel experience and also to find myself. I ended up living in Essex with three other roommates. They were all women, all a bit older than I was. I was 24 at the time. Megan was 31, Cherry was 34, and Cassie was 38. Megan was from New York and Cherry was from New Jersey and Cassie was from Poland. All four of us shared this three-story flat. The back of our home was the living room and kitchen. The back wall was complete glass that looked out into the garden. The garden was completely fenced in and the house had uh, an interesting dynamic to say the least. Tons of stories from that time in my life but I'll stick to this one. So, I adore all of my roommates, except for Cherry. After living with Cherry for seven months, I was over her antics. One day, I came home from work. I locked the door, make myself something to eat, and go up to bed. I brought some work home with me, so I'm in my nightie with all these papers around me and my headphones on jamming out. I had headphones on because Cherry was out to dinner with work friends. That meant booze, and then soon after, that a tantrum was surely to come. I just didn't want to have to listen to her crazy scream crying that night. I'm working away, completely focused, until I feel something. I look up to see a, a man standing over me. I don't register it right away and passively say, Cherry's room is on the second floor, and continue to work. Cherry regularly brought strange men home. But he doesn't leave. Again... I say, Cherry's room is downstairs, you... He then interrupts. I'm not here for Cherry, he says. A cold chill iced my veins. My fight or flight kicked in just then, and I started surveying the situation. I look him up and down. He has a bottle of Prosecco in one hand and a knife in the other. He's about 5'10", wild muddy brown hair, and really black eyes. He has a light polo shirt on and the side of his collar is popped up, a distinct Manchester accent. Once I focused in, I realized that his eyes were black because his pupils were completely dilated. I was in trouble. I needed an escape plan, but unfortunately, this man was standing in between me and my bedroom door. Obviously, I needed to get downstairs, but I needed for him to think that it was his idea so I decided to play along. Just then he uses his knife to pop the cork. Presco is starting to flow out onto my carpet. I said, oh no, let's clean that up. I prefer to drink out of proper flute anyways. He nodded, replying, yeah, you're a proper classy bird, let's go. I try to act as natural as possible. I try not to show that I'm shaking all over and try to gain control over my breathing. We take the long journey down to the main floor of my flat, all three floors. He has the back of my nighty bunched up in one hand and I could feel the point of the knife graze my back with his other. I was trying to playfully speak with him as he walked down the stairs. I couldn't tell you what I was saying, I was most likely just rambling I think. I couldn't really hear anything too, over my heart beating in my ears. We get to the bottom of the stairs and there's a hallway to my left that leads to the front door. On my right, which is much closer to us, is the kitchen and the living room. We make our way into the kitchen. I point to the cabinets that we had the wine glasses in. He said that he knew where they were and started heading towards them. I now had the kitchen table in between us and it was time to run. I burst into a sprint down the hallway towards the door. My hands fumbled over the locks, shaking and sweating. I swing open the door and see two men walking across the street. They must have been walking home from the train or something. There was a big train station in front of our home. I call out to them for help and suddenly I'm flung onto the ground. Little pebbles pierce my skin, sending sharp pains where they jabbed. The intruder pushed me out of the way to run and escape. One of the men chased after the intruder while the other said for me to go inside while he surveyed my home and called the police. I locked the doors and I called the cops. While I'm on the phone with dispatch, I manically run around the house to double check all the windows and the doors are shut. Suddenly, I hear a loud bang on my door. I inform the dispatch of the banging and she informs me that police weren't there yet. I thought it might be one of the gentlemen who helped me, so I go to look out the eye hole and it's him, the intruder. 
he came back. He's banging on the door screaming that I had his glasses and that he was not done with me. I absolutely freaked out, obviously. The dispatcher attempts to calm me down, but I'm losing my ever-loving mind over this. She then said, they're pulling onto your street now. You should hear their sirens. And I did. Thank God. The intruder then blasts off. One officer jumps out of the passenger side while the car is still moving and chases after him. The second officer comes into my home and he interviews me over the course of some time. And the two gentlemen. Collects evidence, takes photos, all that stuff. After some time of him being there, Cherry comes home and freaks out. Once the situation was explained to her, she said, Oh, that could have been me. Yeah, thanks Cherry. It's all about you, right? The next morning, I'm called in to identify a man that they had in custody. I pointed him out. I go into a little room and the officer pulls out an evidence bag. He asked if the items were mine. And they were. There were my underwear and photos taken from my home. The officer then informed me that the intruder had apparently been stalking me for some time now. He estimates at least three months and he had made a nest outside of our home on top of a hill that looked over into our living room and kitchen even. He's apparently a, a known offender and drug dealer. He then told me how lucky I was to get out practically unharmed because apparently others weren't so lucky. So I've been searching for some semblance of similarity in somebody else's encounter for three years now, hoping that another's experience might align even a bit with my own to validate it. Until last night, I'd found details aligning with my own encounter, but nothing I felt concrete enough to make my story not sound absolutely insane. It still does sound a bit insane, I know, and I have no way to further explain any of it. So all I have is what I witnessed. I did find a story on here from like 18 days ago that sounds eerily similar to my own though. The key difference being the familiarity of the voices mimicked, leading me to wonder if this thing had been watching us for a while. Anyway, so I was living in West Texas in this national park where the restaurant I was working at at the time rested at the top of a 15 minute hike of a mountain trail from the housing that they had us in. I closed up the restaurant after everyone left each night, so I was always an hour or two later coming down the hill than everybody else. Usually it was pretty empty, really quiet, pretty uncommon to encounter anyone else as the only thing at the top of the mountain is the closed restaurant, a gift shop, a, a store and some of the trailheads. There isn't much reason for anyone else to be on the trail at that hour and this one night I'm coming down, no moon so it was completely pitch black, empty trail, characteristically quiet, around this last bend to get to my house and Right before I get off the trail to take a shortcut through the thicket of the cactus and brush, there were maybe 15 to 20 trees. Even though it's a desert, the top of the mountain has a high Sierra microclimate. When I hear my best friend or roommate call out my name, clear as day, in the other direction. He said my name and when I turned, said it again. In retrospect though, it sounded, I don't know, funny. It was close, 15 yards maybe, but it sounded sort of far off at the same time. Like if somebody recorded his voice from far away but played it very nearby. It just sounded off, but not enough to flip a switch immediately, and maybe I'm painting the memory of it differently than what it actually sounded like. So I'm facing my house, maybe 50 yards away, and the voice comes from directly to my left, on this foothill of the mountain that we'd hike around on sometimes. It has so much more tree coverage than the trail that I was on, and considerably more than the thicket separating me from the clearing surrounding my house. If you walked five feet in the direction the voice came from, you'd completely disappear from the view of anyone on the trail or on the back porch of the house, like immediately. So hearing my friend's voice calling me over, I was like, oh cool, we're night hiking. And I turned to follow it, Right before I take my first step into the tree line, I hear his actual voice down on our porch saying, Hey, who are you talking to? 
which obviously stops me. I turn back to my house, confused, just in time to see this, and it's really hard to explain, but thing burst out of the thicket that I was just about to shortcut through to begin with before hearing this first voice and turning away, and from the exact spot I had walked down every single night, this thing just bolts. It was humanoid technically, but it was tall and way too skinny to be a human, like at least eight feet tall, but super slim. It looked inhumanely slender, in fact. It was hunched over and running like it burst off of a track mark, that sort of thing, but kept that same form the whole time, never got all the way upright. As for the color, that's always really messed with me because, for one, I'm really colorblind, and for some reason it was like greenish, sort of yellow, and I get greens and yellows mixed up a lot. It had a hue of green and yellow though at least, and it looked like it was giving off its own sort of... I don't know, like glow or something, which has always sounded so absolutely ludicrous. I never tell anyone that I do not absolutely trust to give me the benefit of the doubt before thinking that I'm just making the whole thing up. Because if I heard this story, I would honestly think that somebody at the very least might be confused or something. Anyway, our back porch light was on though and the thing lined up with where it would have been shining so if this thing was translucent it definitely could have taken on that like sheen by reflecting the porch light. The colors did kind of line up I guess. If you'd reflected the light it may have looked like this thing's colors I suppose but it certainly wasn't identical. Honestly though I could have sworn that it had its own shine to it like looking at a glow stick that's sort of dying off. More than enough to see, but still kind of faint. Regardless, it was a light that definitely wasn't there a second before when I'd gotten to the shortcut. It would have stuck out for at least 50 yards of the walk. It should be noted too, had I followed that thing's voice, two things probably would have happened. One, I would have completely disappeared from the view of anyone. And two, I would have turned my back on whatever that thing was and entered into a thicket of trees, weeds, and cactus far too dense for me to turn around, run, or fight back, or pretty much anything. Also, that trail that I would have been gone towards leads directly to the edge of a cliff that drops down into a massive break in the mountain. It cleanly drops all of like 6,000 feet to the wide open desert below. That could be the purpose of that direction, maybe. Who knows? To be honest, though... If I was going to try and do some nefarious stuff, it would be the perfect place to both find someone and lead them quickly to a spot where no one else would come up on you. L legit, in the middle of the day you could probably make someone disappear over there if you wanted. It really wouldn't be that hard. Anyway, how this thing was running, it immediately felt like I'd spooked it. Like how a deer runs off at a noise, but this was different in that it seemed a lot more... I don't know determined? It seemed intelligent, aware of its own movement, not just acting out of instinct. Kind of like spooking a person if they'd seen you watching them from the bushes or something. Like spooked but sentient and definitely acting like I just foiled some nefarious plan. So naturally, I also bolted, exposing my back to this thing but taking the opposite slightly longer way to my back porch. My buddy, and bless his soul, is still there when I make it, and he asks again, who are you with? His face is just as confused, and he keeps looking past me, and I'm like, you heard it too, right? And he says, yeah, where are they? And I was like, what? There were multiple? Apparently, from his perspective, he had heard multiple voices alongside of my own, all carrying on and joking around, talking back and forth pretty loudly, he said that there were at least three other voices talking to mine, but that it sounded like a, a whole crowd coming down the trail. He said that he could clearly hear us getting closer, and for the past few minutes, it just assumed that I'd run into a hiking group and were talking with them as we headed down. Which is not the most uncommon thing in the daytime, but pretty uncommon for that hour of night. It took me a minute to show him that I wasn't messing with him and that I had not just split off from a group of hikers. I was completely alone and had not vocalized a word until he called up to ask, who are you with? It took a second to even express my side of what was going on, 
I was so out of whack, I couldn't find the words to actually explain, so I just kept shouting, I swear I just heard your voice, and then, this thing dude, this thing, or something like that. Eventually it registers that there were no lights on the trail, I wasn't using a flashlight that night, so maybe there was actually some moon out, and I just heard his voice calling me off trail and into the dark, and we both began trying to figure out what the heck we'd just witnessed. Now, this part might be a little crazy, but I'm not implying anything, I'm just saying. This is what I'd been doing on the walk down before this happened, so obviously walking home solo, I, I hadn't actually said a word. Whoever he heard was certainly not me, and I certainly didn't come with a crowd. But I had been praying like crazy on the hike down. There had just been this super dark sort of negative energy in the house lately, and I was trying to kind of... I don't know, surround myself with light and positivity, I guess, asking God to give me strength before I walked back in and out of nowhere, midway through the trail, I got this, like, absolutely overwhelming joy, almost like ecstasy. I was, like, screaming inside, happy, and just felt like I could take on the whole world, basically. Like, no matter what came, I could take it. Maybe I'm implying something because call me crazy, but I've always felt like that had something to do with how the night turned out as opposed to how it maybe would have. I don't know. I know that part really does make me sound insane, but so does the rest of it, to be honest, so whatever. I certainly don't think that it was a coincidence, though. I'm just not sure what to make of, well, any of it, really. And that's pretty much it. The only other thing is our memories of it, really. Out of nowhere, I just sort of stopped thinking of it. Not like forgot it, but like it was hidden behind some sort of a thick fog in my head. The next morning, I told my friend the story, and she uncharacteristically shut me down and just said something like, you're all just crazy and getting scared of these mountains, and just walked away. It really wasn't like her, though, to just dismiss somebody like that, especially a friend, without even hearing them out, too. She was a really empathetic lady, and again, call me crazy, but it seemed like something that triggered a memory in her that she refused to touch and shut it down before it got too close. I could be reading into it, I admit, but that's happened a couple of times with this story, and... We'd been living on that mountain off and on for a few years at that point and had never once heard or seen anything remotely similar to that thing. Until that night, we'd never even heard a story even vaguely resembling that. I mean, it just wasn't like we got spooked of our own house or the trail that we took twice a day every day, and it wasn't like we were seeing and hearing things based on stories that we'd projected into the darkness, you know? But the weirdest, the absolute weirdest thing happened the moment that she walked away. It was legit like, like a fog just slowly poured over the memory and the last time I remember thinking of it was that moment and then it just disappeared for months. How in the world does something that massive, that frightening happen in your life and you just stop thinking about it? And then one day it just popped back up. I was honestly so surprised and unsure of how I hadn't thought of it in so long it was almost more baffling than anything we actually witnessed. I asked my friend just before I sent this and if he'd felt the same fog thing and he said, absolutely. He doesn't really like talking about that night, honestly, and he's told me that I cannot help but bring it up as often as possible, hoping by talking it through that we'd find some sort of explanation for, well, any of what happened. Even as I share this, though, I I felt like I'd asked him a million times already and just forgotten his answer. Maybe I have and I've just forgotten or had that fog thing happen again. I don't know. I'm getting all confused and this whole thing is just crazy, I know. But that's pretty much everything. I'm sorry if this was really confusing and all over the place. But I really felt like I, I needed to convey as absolutely many details as I could possibly remember, just in case somebody listening to this had any sort of experience with any part of it. A mimic, a, a humanoid, or the memory loss, or anything. I really don't know what to make of all of this. All I have are the details of that night, and 
my foggy memory doing something bizarre afterward. I've never known what to make of it, but I just figured maybe somebody else might be in the same boat as me and maybe need to see some sort of validation. Just validation, I guess. Anyway, thanks for listening, and it's good to finally speak about this, even if it's just over the internet. When I was around seven years old, my mum and I lived in these apartments in a border town. My mum's a single mother, and in our apartment complex, like most, it had a playground in it. Luckily, our apartment was on the bottom floor and right next to the playground. And like most kids, I loved playing there. Every day I would play there, and I honestly can't remember, but my mum either went inside the apartment to grab something or let me play alone, but... While she was gone, a random lady approached me. I'd never seen this lady before, but she told me that she had a huge Barbie doll house and a lot of toy Barbies. She told me that she lived not too far and asked if I wanted to go and play. I remember saying, I have to ask my mum first. And that's when she said that she knew my mum and that it's okay. I didn't know any better and I agreed to go. She grabbed my hand and led me to her house. She did have a lot of Barbie toys too, and I was playing, but she didn't have other children around, so I'm not sure why she had all those dolls. Apparently I was gone for some time because it started to get dark, and that's when there were loud bangs on the front door. The lady opened the door, and it was my mum. She looked so frightened. She grabbed me and moved me out of the apartment complex soon after that happened, and honestly... I don't really remember what happened after that. This memory came back to me not long that. This memory came back to me not that long ago, and my mum told me that that was the worst thing that has ever happened. But I don't remember feeling afraid. Honestly, who knows what that lady had planned for me. Since we live like five minutes from the Mexican border, it is known for trafficking children, and I could have easily been taken to Mexico and never seen again. My mum did tell me that the only reason that she found me was because a bystander saw me walk off with that lady and then saw my mum frantically looking for me. And who knows what would have happened if that person hadn't have seen me that day. So it was about 2000 or 2001. My best friend and I were 12 to 13 years old. We lived in a small town in rural Minnesota, about 2,000 people. Out of our friend group, her and I were the only two that lived out in the country, so we understood the boredom that could ensue, but the fun things that would come out of it. Exploring the woods, running around in the cornfields, creating forts, exploring the abandoned house on their property, etc. It was a really fun time for us. But one day, we decided to take our bikes and ride down some gravel roads. Her little brother tagged along. He was maybe, I don't know, nine or ten at the time. But we were riding along, laughing, probably picking on her brother, when we see an old shack in one of the cornfields. The corn wasn't fully grown yet, so we were able to see most of it. But we decided to explore it because, I mean, why not, right? I'm now 33, so bear with my memory. I don't remember much about the outside, but I do remember what I saw inside and... It still gives me the creeps to this day. We peered inside and the first thing that I noticed were posters on the wall of the room. They were on every wall as well. There was a different person on every poster and they looked angry. Some held guns pointed right at you. Some were pointing their finger and it felt like they were pointing right at us with their eyes trained on us. In the center of the floor was a perfectly painted red circle as well. My friend and I, we remember a star in the middle of it, but her little brother just remembers the circle. And as we were staring at this creepy scene, I feel like we're all of a sudden being watched, and not by the posters. I look to my right across the gravel road and into the cornfield across from us, and standing in the middle of the field, all of a sudden, is a man. He's just watching us. He's not waving his arms, not yelling at us, just watching. 
I quickly alert my friends and we look at him together. I awkwardly sort of wave and he continues to just stand there, no wave back. We are sufficiently creeped out so we jump on our bikes to get away. We're on gravel which isn't easy to bike on so it's taking us a while to get going. We bike away and I repeatedly turn around to see if he's still there and he is still watching us. In fact he barely moved and only turned his body slightly to angle in our direction to keep watching. I still can't get over how he just appeared in the middle of a field like that too. I have no idea how we didn't see him in the first place. But recently, uh, I've been thinking about this. So my friend, her brother and I started a group chat. We all shared what we remembered and they basically said everything that I did above. What I didn't know though was that they went back the next day. And apparently when they did, everything was gone even the red paint on the floor. A week later, whoever owned it donated it to the fire department to be burnt. I don't know what was going on in that shack. Some thoughts have been like weird rituals, target practice for some militia dude, or just some weird creepy guy who had terrible taste. Whatever it was, it still weirds me out to this day, and the fact that everything disappeared only makes it that much more creepy I guess. So three of my friends and I drove to Breezewood as a staging ground for a nice nighttime tour of the abandoned PA Turnpike. It's a long underground tunnel that cuts through the mountains. In the spirit of October we decided to check it out late at night so we set off from our hotel in Breezewood around maybe 10.30. To get ourselves even more psyched up, I played some creepy music along the way as we entered the dark forest. We arrived at the entrance of a trail that leads to a section of the Sidling Hill Tunnel about maybe 15 minutes later. For the next hour and a half, it was mostly chill. We walked to the tunnel entrance, explored a little side room, and overall messed around in the tunnel by laughing at all the funny graffiti and taking cursed videos. When we reached the end of the tunnel though, we spent maybe 10 minutes looking around for a way up to the ventilation room. We couldn't find a path outside and the staircase leading up was destroyed. We turned around to being our long walk back, but within 5 minutes of backtracking, we noticed something when we all turned off our lights in the tunnel. There was a faint light shining behind us. Out of what seemed to be sheer instinct I guess, Two of my friends began running, more of a jog than a sprint, but me and the other friend kept up, and eventually we slowed down and made our lights as dim as possible. At first I was unsure of why we were being so paranoid, but one of my friends later pointed out how it's better to not take any chances of encountering someone past midnight in such a secluded area, so it made sense. What added to our suspicion though was how the people, we assumed that it was at least two, behind us were not only pursuing us, but we could tell that they were running by how their lights were bouncing, but how they occasionally called out into the darkness of the tunnel, and how they occasionally blacked out like we did. Our fast walk turned into a full-blown sprint after we eventually hear a very loud resonant metallic sound, like a huge gong being struck which of course was amplified and reverberated by the tunnel's acoustics. Even while sprinting, I saw their light behind us bouncing up and down as if they too were running and getting closer now. We got out of the tunnel, shaken by what had just happened, and reflected on how suspicious it was that not only they pursued us, but also turned off their lights from time to time. We were also confused about the source of what could only be described as a loud gong, a friend jokingly brought up cultists, but I assumed that they were just messing with some loose metal pipes. We all made it home with no sign of them pursuing us outside of the tunnel, but I'm glad that we didn't take the chance of trying to encounter them face to face. I've given it some thought over the years, and whatever those people were up to, it definitely didn't seem good. I was uh, eight years old when we first moved into the house on the edge of the forest. My parents had their doubts about buying a house with a backyard bordered by forest. They had concerns about 
wild animals getting into our bins and stuff or hurting our dogs and we're worried one of us might go too far into the trees and get lost. But it was cheap. My dad liked the seclusion, my mum loved the house itself and my siblings and I, we were excited about playing in the backyard and exploring the forest. I guess our first sign that something wasn't right was that our dogs were absolutely terrified of that forest. They never went into the forest for any reason. If a toy that they'd been playing with found its way past the tree line, they would refuse to retrieve it. And when one of us went in, they would pace anxiously until we returned. On occasion, we'd notice the dog staring at a spot in the forest in obvious distress, Sometimes growling or even barking, but we could never really see anything there. My brother once carried one of the dogs into the trees to show her that there was nothing scary about it, but she wriggled out of his grip and sprinted into the house in a panic. If we were in the backyard when it was getting dark, we would also sometimes hear noises like, I don't know, someone was walking through the forest maybe sticks crunching underfoot, branches being pushed aside. If we called out there, there was no response, but if we shined a flashlight around, we would occasionally catch a glimpse for just a split second of something that we could swear looked like a person walking around in the dark. Upon hearing that, my parents quickly banned us from entering the forest at all after dark, and even during the day, we weren't allowed to go out of sight of the house. My sister's bedroom window actually looked out at the backyard and the forest beyond, and she remembers looking out her window one night and seeing a shadowy figure standing right at the edge of the backyard. But she said that there was something wrong with it. Like, it wasn't quite standing on the ground, but it was a little too tall to be a person, and it was sort of distorted, she said. But she was convinced that it was staring straight at her. She called out for our dad saying that there was a man in the yard staring through her window and when he ran outside to chase off whoever it was, she continued to watch the figure. It didn't move away but when the light from our dad's flashlight passed over it, it just suddenly wasn't there anymore, she said. We also regularly heard knocking at the back door at night with no one there. My parents thought that it was teenagers playing pranks and stopped bothering even opening the door at one point. Until one rainy night when the knocking was so persistent it agitated them. And my mum pointed out that there might be someone needing shelter from the heavy rain outside but when she opened the door not only was there nobody there but there were no wet footprints on the porch either. The knocking continued the whole time that we lived there it would happen several times in the span of like a few weeks, then stop for months, and then just randomly start up again. My parents even went as far as to install security cameras, but again, there was never anyone at the door. The camera wasn't all useless though. You see, about three years into living there, my brother started having night terrors and sleepwalking. When he went sleepwalking, he would always go out the back door and start walking towards the forest. My mum, being a light sleeper, would hear the door open and would run out to get him before he made it into the forest. After the third or fourth time it happened, my brother asked to see the camera footage because he wanted to see how he looked when sleepwalking, I guess thinking that it would look funny or something. But the footage showed him walking out onto the porch, then pausing as if listening to something, shaking his head, then reluctantly walking forward as if being sort of pulled or forcefully guided by something. One evening, my dad was in the backyard and he heard my sister calling him from the forest, seemingly in distress, thinking that she'd gone exploring in the forest and fallen over or hurt herself. He ran in and started calling to her, but quickly realized that it was way too dark to see her and he couldn't pinpoint where her voice was coming from. He told her to wait where she was while he grabbed a flashlight and when he ran back into the house for the flashlight, he saw my sister inside, safe and completely unconcerned. At the time, my dad hadn't told us about hearing my sister's voice in the forest, so 
when I heard my mum's voice coming from the forest months later while I was outside with the dogs one evening. I myself didn't question it, despite the fact that I'd seen my mum inside recently and hadn't noticed her walk past me. My mum was calling to me, saying that she'd gotten her sweater caught in some branches and needed me to come in and help her. As I walked in though, the dog started barking, alerting my dad, who saw me through the window wandering into the forest. He quickly came outside and called to me, and I said that I was just helping mum. But he yelled back that mum was inside and I needed to run back to the house as fast as I could, which upon hearing that, I did. It was after this too that my parents had a fence built around the backyard and started looking for a new place. In the time between the fence being built and us moving out, man, it got way worse. We'd hear knocking at the door more regularly as well as tapping on the windows now, as if someone was walking around the perimeter of the house and trying every window. We would often hear scratching and scraping sounds on the fence and voices beyond it. My brother's night terrors got way more frequent, and one night, my mum didn't hear the door open when he went sleepwalking, and he woke up standing at the fence, staring into the forest, with the dogs barking at him. The last morning we spent there, less than four years after we moved in, we woke up to find the back door fully open, and the security camera footage showed that it just slowly swung open on its own. Since moving out, my brother's sleepwalking has stopped, though he still gets night terrors and he suffers from pretty severe anxiety now. A few nights ago, he called me out of the blue and after a bit of small talk, he asked me if I think the door being open that final night means whatever was out there finally got in. He was trying to make light of it, saying that he was getting into the spirit of Halloween, joking about how maybe we should all get exercised, just in case something latched onto us all those years ago. But I think that he's deeply bothered by everything that happened, to be honest. I know that I am a little bit still, and I still get nervous around dark wooded areas. I don't know what I think was out there in the forest behind our house at night, but... I get the feeling, given the chance, it would have swallowed us whole.